Okay, guys, we're going to get going very shortly. So, um, who wasn't here yesterday? Put your hands up. Who wasn't here yesterday? Right, you missed a great day. You really did. Um, but Tommy Walsh was on yesterday, just for you guys, so you get the concept of what we're going to do next. Um, Tommy Walsh was on yesterday, and it was very emotional. He opened up. He's a big celebrity. Um, but when he were left last night, I said to him, I knew he'd got his problems that he announced the night before. Um, and he told me the night before that he wasn't sure whether he was going to tell you guys about his possible cancer today because his agent told him not to. His agents don't like that sort of news going out when you're a celebrity. It's something that they really do fight not to promote. So I said to him, so why did you tell the audience yesterday, Tommy? He said, I have to say, as a celebrity, I do these things all the time at different conferences. I get my fee, I come, I do my bit, and I go, and I say, thank you for the money, and I'm off. And that's how he does it as a celebrity. A, he never charges a penny to come, which was fantastic. So, but he also said, when I was sat there all day, and I listened, and then I got up on stage, he said, you don't lie to family. And he really felt that he was with family yesterday. And that's why he announced it to us all. His agent went ballistic, um, but he said, I don't care. I don't lie to my family, so why would I lie to all those? He said, I really felt part of the family yesterday. And I think that's fantastic. And, you know, every credit to all you guys. And I was watching Twitter last night, and not one message went out last night from any of us. And I think that's brilliant, because he really did. Give, a, give his hope over to us for today. So what we're going to do now is, John's going to come up here now. I'm going to turn to camera, only a little camera, um, and I'm going to say a, word, a few words to Tommy. And then I want us all to cheer, because then I'm going to send that to his phone ready for his appointment today. And I think that just shows that if, if it was any of us, that's what we would do. I know that one year in Nottingham I was ill on the second day and I woke up to a film that this idiot had done for me. And it's a bit special when everyone says nice things and I think he deserves that little bit of hope from us all today. So, John, you, you plant me where do you want me? When you feel as well when you... Not, not now, but when you... <laughs> Hi Tommy, hope today goes really well for you. Um, we're all hoping, we're all wishing you the best of luck. Thank you for yesterday, and I hope everything goes well today. That'll be on ground force in about a month. <laughs> <laughs> so, over to you, sir. Um, this morning I've got to dish, dash off because I'm on the radio regarding this dental issue. Um, where's Ali? Ali, if you've got five minutes to come off with me, I could just do with you possibly being with me or give me some facts and figures around the dentist side. So the main researcher at the BBC has reached out to me and they want me to do a piece for TV and for radio that's going to go out at some point today, hopefully, on the basis of what the dentists have said. Um, they heard about this conference and they wanted our feedback instantly. So I think, again, it's incredible that the BBC has suddenly found us. So I'm going to hand over to my wonderful president, and he's going to keep you on track. And without me there, I don't know how you're going to cope, but I promise I will uh, see you a bit later on. Right. Ali, do you want to come out for me? Thanks. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome. And, and as promised, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon Herds of wild beasts sweeping across the, for those who know, 40 towers. Sure. Welcome to Torquay. Um, good morning. Actually, for those who remember, Tommy talked me. about a bony growth yesterday, and shortly afterwards, it worked out it was just a thing called an osteophyte. So it's nothing just get me up, and more related to his wear and tear as a builder. Oh, we can see, I think we're going to hear Chris going for a pee shortly. Um, <laughs> So, without further ado, I've got it. Emma Riley, who's a, de a lot of a dental, I don't want to say dental nurse, there's so much sort of more. Oh, you are more. You are more, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and also, it, it's, and the title is, is 
look, listen, and you don't know either. Keeping an eye on looking in mouths and checking for mouth cancer. Emma's got it better than that. Do you want to? Yeah, of course. Thank you. Hiya. <laughs> <laughs> <Hiya. laughs> um, where is the screen? Sorry, I'm an, I am an international speaker. Where is it? Is it? Oh, there it is. Um, <laughs> Then, yeah, just to introduce myself, um, I am a Mancunian, so do any of you need subtitles or anything like that? Because you're a bit posh down here. I am a, I'm just reading it, actually. I am the patron of the society. Any dental nurses here? Yes, 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 yes. So I am a pa- thank- I'm proud to be a dental nurse. Um, <laughs> so I am the patron of the Society of British Dental Nurses, uh, something I'm really proud to join. £30 a year. Um, I'm also an ambassador for the Mouth Cancer Foundation. Even if you don't like this talk, they've let me out today, and I'm sure they want to get rid of me as an ambassador, because I swear and I'm an inappropriate. So if you could just put, she was all right, hashtag okay, um, when, when I finished. Um, I'm a mum. I am a daughter. What else am I? High-class escort. Um, <laughs> all right escort <laughs> and I, I do these talks I've, I've, I've been working with Max Facts for 30 odd years I was also the Macmillan Oral Health Practitioner for the UK uh, it was a role that was um, I sort of made my own and I've spoke to people who work for Macmillan I firmly believe they need a dental nurse in that role in trusts as, as a dental nurse who bridges that gap because I think we're great as a dental nurse or a hygienist or a therapist. So when I left Pen- Pennine um, because of a... Do-, do, you want, do you want to hear about the divorce? It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> we don't like Graham Riley. Just put that on hashtag Graham Riley. No one likes him. Um, we, um, I then left Pennine and the role then just went. And I know from some of my patients who still follow me, the couple have got restraining orders against me. Um, they miss that role. They miss somebody having a chat and they miss somebody sort of talking to them away from the surgery. Does that make sense? So I'm really good at them kind of talks, but I've gone out of my comfort zone with the elderly because we are seeing more and more in care homes with mouth cancers. And unfortunately, my mum has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's um, three years ago. And I, I sat there the other night thinking, what would, well, it was a few months ago, what would I do if she, if, could I detect a mouth cancer in her? And she was an de- ex-dental nurse, better one than me. And um, I wondered if I would be able to look in her mouth. So it, it got my mind working. So this talk today is more about our elderly, and I am championing our elderly. Elderly is, or the old, older person is termed over 65. Well, I'm 53, so... How many of you, look, yeah, you're crying now. <laughs> You'll all need therapy after I've left today. It's, I think that's pretty young, do you? So, yeah, exactly. So that's termed as older person. So I think it applies to a lot of us. Do I press this next? I'm a bit thick, yeah. Oh, you're going to get a world exclusive on a video that we've done for the Mouth Cancer Foundation today on screening in care homes. All right, so stay awake. <laughs> I liked this quote from Tipa Snow. Has anybody heard of Tipa Snow? Could you Google her after you've left me today? She's done a fantastic video. Uh, The link on her video will be on the Mouth Cancer website of how to look after somebody's mouth with dementia or Alzheimer's, whichever one they're suffering from. My mum's got mixed. Um, And I loved this. Dementia doesn't rob someone of their dignity. It's our reaction to them that does. And I think we need to remember that. What do they reckon? 2040 is going to be 1.5 million of us living with dementia. Um, and let's also remember, mouth cancers or any cancer don't go, I'm not visiting her because she's got dementia. That'd be, too compl- that'd be too complicated to go to her. It, it does. And can you imagine somebody having a mouth cancer in a care home with dementia? Horrific. So I think we need to know about these things. So please have a look at Tipa. She's a lovely, happy-looking person, isn't she? And she's American. Any Americans here? We love Americans. And um, she's lovely. She's dead, she's dead personable. She's a lovely, lovely lady. Look at the video um, if you get time on the Mouth Cancer's website. So what we did was... Any of you seen these leaflets from the Mouth Cancer Foundation? So what we did was look, listen and observe... 
Um, so we're, we're not screening as such of looking in the mouth gob, we call it in Manchester, um, of lift your tongue up. In, I can't do that. I, there's no way I can do that. Any of you worked in residential homes, gone in and done some education in it? Yeah. Even getting in the mouth to brush the teeth is, is a nightmare. So, and we're also dealing with HCAs or health workers who, who don't have any dental training. Do you, they don't know how to look in the mouth. But they have a responsibility to check for any cancers in there or something that doesn't look right. So what we did, we looked at the look, listen and observe. So any numbness or tingling in the lips and tongue. You're going to say to me, how do they know if they've got any um, tingling? These workers who work with your, your elderly or the older population, they become family to them. They sort of know when there's something wrong. Any of you got kids? I've got Thomas and Satan. And... Uh, <laughs> God, she's ugly. And it's a shame because she, she inherited everything her dad did. This is why they want me to leave the Mouth Cancer Foundation. Um, I've, got, I've got two kids. And when Tom was ill, I knew a few days before he didn't smell right. Just please tell me I'm not sounding like some pervert. <laughs> I knew he was brewing something. That's what I'm trying to say. These carers get that feeling with their elderly residents. So if they've got a tingling or numbling, they might be messing with their face. Yeah, Noticeable changes in eating habits. They're told that they've got to watch them sit down for their grub. They've got to watch any changes that, that's happening when they're eating. Mood swings, um, marked alteration in daily, daily, daily lifestyle, yeah? Speech variations, sore throat, hoarseness. They've got, it's knowing that person. Sore throat, I've mentioned. Dentures that, don't, that suddenly stop fitting properly. So I would expect them to um, know if a denture's got loose with them losing weight. There's a, there's a lovely slide from um, Health Education England. I don't know if anybody saw of a post-mortem of somebody who'd actually... Yeah, you know the picture. <laughs> the denture had gone where it shouldn't. So I would expect if that denture had got loose over a few months, they'd know about it. But we're talking about a denture that's all of a sudden stopped fitting. I want that noting in their care plan. Agreed? Yeah? Um, unusual odour. We all know what odour, don't we? It is a different kind of smell that's coming from the oral cavity. All of this needs writing down. Because if it was happening anywhere else in the body, do you agree? They'd have put something written down about it. But because it's this area, it's deemed different to the rest of the body. Are you following? Are you all awake? God, you're a crowd, you lot. I've done all my best jokes and everything. Um, also, attention should be made to the skin and face. Um, so new swelling, spots, moles, changes of colour and texture of the skin. Again, if they were bathing them, they would notice if that mole on their back had changed. If they had a pressure sore that didn't look right, they would get tissue viability in or they'd get the district nurse in. Yeah, to have a look. Why are we not doing it with the head and neck? Following? Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, it's a good talk, this, actually. I'm surprised. So um, <laughs> I thought I'd do something on basic oral care as well. So... This is what we do. We always apply a lubricant to the lips before we start doing oral care, um, whatever lubricant that they're using. A little bit. So what I will do is I'll put the gloves on and I will put a little bit of the gel on the back of my hand, a pea size amount, and I'll apply it to the lips so I'm not pulling their lips around when they do. So if you end up caring for somebody who is elderly, this could be your husband, your wife, a, a, a sibling, this is what I would like you to do before because... People tend to bypass the lips. Have you noticed that? That when you do oral care, they'll go in and they'll go straight, open your, open your gob, open your mouth, get in there. Boom, 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 boom. The lips get pulled around and the lips can get cracked. So these gels that the, the, your healthcare professionals are prescribing you are to do just a lovely little bit around the lips. Following? Yeah. Damp gauze, if there's anywhere that's got coated areas, you can do that. Don't do that if it's somebody you know is going to take your finger off. Um, <laughs> but they do get that look in their eye. Although a, parking, <laughs> although a Parkinson patient, I don't know whether you know, has got an involuntary shut, so they won't walk, you, you don't get a warning about that. Um, who, do they use sponge sticks down here? Pink swabs? So they've, ba they've banned them in Wales. Um, you know why they got banned, don't you? Because they came off. Can I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm on the fence with them because I actually use pink swabs for end of life patients because I can get in and just remove any residue that's in there. Pink swabs were abused and not used correctly. So if you've got a dressing, so imagine I've got a wound on me. The, the, the district nurse will come and look at me. She'll get a pack, won't she? She'll open it up. She'll give it a good clean. What does she do with that pack then? Yellow bag, gone. 
greed. We don't do that with pink sponges. They're left in that pink mouthwash all day. You'll go visiting some wards and playing, the kids are playing Zorro with them. I donated a load to... Um, I'm not saying where I donated a load. I've got some different green swabs for a, a place and they were using them to do painting with the residents. 13p each, them. You know, so please... It, it, Check the integrity. They are not designed to be left in water all day, but should they be left in water all day? It's disgusting. Nowhere else in the body would that happen. Do we agree on that? Oh, we'll just leave that dressing there for all day, and then we'll just keep going back to it and using it. Yeah? Um, apply, the lip, apply the gels around the mouth. Any of you who've come to, my, to our stands, and there's two stands here doing in dry mouth stuff, you must, for me, use the gel as if it was a... I'm not saying medicine... But it is a pro it is, it's something that your healthcare workers advised you to use for your dry mouth because it's doing a job. Following me? It's not nice having a load of gel in your mouth. But what we say is use it before bed. Because it's got all the enzymes in that I've got in my saliva that should be in my saliva. You inherit your spit from your parents. Did you know that? There's some evidence around that. I've got good spit. It's on my match profile. <laughs> um... <laughs> um <laughs> I might have to reword it, actually, on my mind. I'm just thinking now, it doesn't sound very good, does it? <laughs> Hashtag pervert. Um, so, because I've got no fillings in my mouth, but that's because, what have I got? Good spit. Um, but it, it's got all the enzymes that you would normally have in salivas, these gels. So what we've been saying is apply it and get in bed and use it as part of your nighttime routine. You've got your pill box, like my mum will have. You've got all these, take it and apply your gel. Only a little bit. So what we do when we're looking in a mouth that's really crusty is we use the gel to basically remove the crusty plugs if they're ready to come off. Does that make So don't pick at them. Let the gel do its work. The gels are fantastic. And then use your sprays. If you're using your sprays, any of you, could you please put it underneath the tongue and into both cheeks? Because that's where normal saliva will come from. So you're fooling your brain. Don't just get it in the eye and the person in the next bed and you're doing all that. Brush teeth where possible with a soft um, toothbrush, a non-foaming, low-mint, flavourless toothpaste. Everybody knows about SLS-free toothpastes. Yeah? So with my dementia group... My, some of my patients don't know how to spit. They can't. They spit out. Now they're just dribbling down. I've got to be honest, with a, with a um, SLS-free, no foaming toothpaste, it's easier for me when I'm brushing teeth. I'll, I'll be dead honest with you, because they don't look like they've got rabies. We've not got rabies in Manchester. Not yet. Um, dentures cleaned as per guidance, or leave that, because I've not... I'm, mindful of the time and apply mouth gels as prescribed i think a bit of feedback we've had on the stands is that sometimes they've got too many products and they don't know what they're quite doing i, I had a patient who was still using diflam five years after because they thought it was lubricating the mouth well no one sat them down and said it, it's helping it that does that that does that and that does that i think they must open the cupboard sometimes and just see this array of stuff yeah although before we had these gels do you know what we used ky jelly one couple loved it because we, we got a load in for them and the kids came to visit and they went, well, <laughs> better life than me. <laughs> um, but we also used olive oil and butter. Bit of Lurpak in there, it's grand. Um, so this is where we have sort of graduated on a bit from that. Um, this was, I wanted to put this in about caring for somebody's mouth with a mouth cancer. Uh, and I, I think I've got a slide of somebody in a residential home. I think it must be really scary for those people who are doing, health, uh, doing mouth cancer uh, oral care because they've not had the training that maybe you and I have got. And there are more elderly being looked after in care homes, aren't there? Because they can't be on hospital wards. So we say even though it might be a bit challenging and scary, it still must be prioritised. It, it, I think the, I was at a hospital recently doing some training and they'd lumped oral care in with personal care. So it was there with brushing the hair and everything else. It's not, it's, a, it's an area of the body it, and it's a really important area of the body which deserves its own, I don't know, it needs to be prioritised. Sarah Hurley, who I, was our um, chief, what was she, dental officer? She was pretty big anyway. Um, she said, let's put the mouth back in the body. I don't know if you ever heard that slogan. It should have never left the body. It was always been in the body. Um, I always got them to do pain relief before I went up to the wards to do the oral care. An hour before, I'd ask them just to give them a little bit of 
ramp up the roll, uh, the pain relief so that when I went in, because you think oral care is just, it can be painful. It can be really painful. And mentally the patients would say to me, I felt, I know I've had my pain relief, so I'm actually not as, not as wound up about you coming to do it. Look at approach. So us dental nurses, us, us heroes of the dental surgery with our capes on, we don't come at you like this. I'm not, I'm not going to do a Peter Kay and come at you and do... I might lubricate you in a bit, but that's a different talk. Um, we don't come at you like this. We come from a different angle, yeah? So don't, we don't sort of come at you with Zorro. We're different. So look at your approach when you're doing your loved one's oral care. We're trained to do it a different... Do you agree, you lot? I mean, some autistic people want you to come at them from the front. And actually, the Admiral, the admiral uh, nurses, they come from the front, but I will always ask the person who's looking after them. But human nature is to come right face on, and there's nothing more. That's when they start punching you. Des desensitisation de techniques, has anybody heard of those? I think there's a slide on it in a bit, and I'm, I'll probably, I don't know whether I've got time to do it. I always desensitise before I do somebody's mouth. Not massaging and feet massaging and getting the oils out, but what I do is I stroke their face, getting their fingers used to my, to my fingers before I dive into their mouth. So if you're looking after somebody's... Is it hissing or is it me? It's not me. Oh, I can't hear me now. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. Um, so I will, even, I still do it even with people who are end of life or whatever, even if somebody's not, you know, they're asleep. I will always stroke that, that can I just say as well, speech, any speech and language here, they'll do this because it's what, who I learnt it from. Um, I've learnt more from speech and language than any other professionals I've worked with. You're looking at me going, she's just tickling him. But, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. But it worked, for me, it worked because you'll do it because you're hopefully going through the same orifice as me. If you're not, there's a problem. Um, <laughs> but it gets them used because I think the first time they know somebody's doing oral care is the toothbrush is in the mouth. So it just makes it a little bit easier for them. Um, have all your equipment there. Make sure it's all there rather than, oh, I need to go and get that. And off you go. And by the time you've got back with somebody, even with dementia, you've lost the room. A bit like me now. And ideally have a pen torch. But again, anybody who's working on wards or in care homes, pen torches are like hen's teeth, aren't they? But I will always have a pen torch with me. How am I doing for time? All right. It's great, this, isn't it? So I'm okay. Thank you. I didn't know. Thank you very much. Um, Promotion of self-care. This is a really, really busy slide. And because I know I don't want to run over, there's tips. I, I, do you get these slides after, after we've... Is that my alarm? That's the alarm I have when I get up in the morning. Um, I'll, I'll give the slides because there's an awful lot of um, information on there. But it's, CBR is carers resi resistant behaviour. So you're basically looking at trying to get in there and you're looking at tips to get into the mouth and do oral care without them knowing it yeah you're priming you, you can be using um ob objects for them to hold some of them have got um babies they've got dolls that we brush the teeth on the on the baby i've done oral care in a car park i don't know why but that's the only place that person with dementia said let's go into the car park off we go i'll go into the car park i know with my mum now it's certain times of the day she wants it doing can I just say as well, I'm really sorry if I'm rabbiting on, what was dentistry like 70 years ago? Not down here, it was nice down here, it's posh, it's the English Riviera. Um, but up in Manchester, <laughs> they, they hurt people 70 years ago, dentists in some cases. It was brutal dentistry, that's what I'm trying to say. Have you ever heard of the bookshelf analogy with dementia? So there's, yeah. So th there's a bookshelf. Here, these books here are falling off and these are the short-term memory. Okay, they're falling off. So my mum's are falling off. There'll be a time when she doesn't recognise me, although she'll know that I'm somebody that she loves. Okay, further down here, the, the books are not falling off as, as much, and that's a long term memory. So down here on the bottom shelf could be a visit to the dentist. You following? What was her? What's her memory of that dentist? Get away! Get away! Get away! So it's dental phobia in a different way because it's the bookshelf down here. Does that because that bookshelf really helps me with my mum? So, whenever you're looking in somebody's mouth, be it a patient, a, your relative, your loved one, uh, somebody at the bus stop, remember that they might think, Whoa, 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 hang on a minute, I don't want you looking in my mouth. 
Okay, so all this is pretty in-depth. There's the hand-on-hand, -hand, which you can have a look for deeper, but there's techniques of doing oral care on the elderly. I shouldn't call them the elderly anymore, it's the older person, because we're all nearly in that bracket. <laughs> distraction, I've mentioned the distraction techniques. You'll see in the video, the, they've taken out the words, but we actually said to this guy who was one of the residents, I'll get you a brew if you let me brush your teeth. So there's the sort of techniques of doing this. It's not easy, but can I also say you've got to keep trying. I was in, um, I was in a home recently where we were, they were showing around a new starter and they passed one bedroom and they went, don't even try her oral care, she won't let you. But she might, she might like that person. She might suddenly, that person's face might be something, a face that she likes. Would you ignore any other web place in the body doing that? You wouldn't. You'd keep trying. Um, this, again, is the desensitisation. So when you get the slides, you'll be, this is what the speech and language should be doing, and you do, whereas I'm just tickling everything. Um, <laughs> but what I do is I put a little bit of gel on my, on my finger, again, on the back of my hand, and as I'm, as I'm desensitising with them, I can actually get some of the gel into their mouth. And explain what you're doing, and try and do it at a certain time every day. Um, use a familiar toothpaste and toothbrush. And if they're sensitive, try a non-foaming toothpaste and a flavourless toothpaste. Sometimes um, a flavoured toothpaste can spark um, the saliva glands and the sensory issues. Look at these low foaming ones as well. If, if Parkinson's pe uh, patients, sometimes if they're on lipodopa, it gives them a burning mouth. Don't know whether you knew that. And a burning mouth can be quite aggravating as well, so the toothpaste can go and not help with that too. We've done some visual aids, if you, if you want these. When in the pandemic, I was looking at the story cards um, for, for, you know, for people with dementia. So there'll be pictures of, of as a cartoon character with a toothbrush. That's your toothbrush, that's your brushing of the hair. So I asked my boss to do these. They are not something like one of these magnificent apps, believe me. But, so when my mum looks in the mirror soon, she's not going to recognise her. She's going to see herself further down the bookshelf. Are you with me? She'll see herself. She won't recognise her own face. She remembers herself years ago. So what with these this appy thing, I don't know what it is, to be honest, you, you basically get a picture of them as a youngster or in a teenager or in the 20s because they put those pictures on the doors in the homes, if you noticed, so that they know that's them. And what we can do is we can put a toothbrush over that picture with me so that you could make up a storybook with their faces because my mum doesn't know what that face is that cartoon she, she doesn't know what it is and then you can put a brush by the way this is very crudely done because my boss has done it, it don't cost anything but if you want to look at them you can do and you can make a personalized storybook for them yeah this was I keep, I keep forgetting it's not there this was one of the mouth cancers in manchester is that that's got yeah, that's one. Um, we have had in Rochdale, because my team cover the Rochdale and Oldham care homes, we've had five in the last nine months with mouth cancers. This was a 92-year-old lady. She'd had, for those who know, dental, um, she'd had a denture stuck in with fixative. She took the upper denture out and she thought some of the fixative was still on her palate and she'd been scraping it. Now, she thought that that why it was sore but then it had turned into this, and I'll take that's three days apart, the bottom one, and then three days later, it was like that, and the home staff needed to then look after this lady, and it was very, very challenging. One of the questions later might be, um, why, what, you know, um, you, Emma, you're asking them to um, detect mouth cancer and screen for mouth cancer, but what can we do with people like this? I get that because we're not going to start throwing chemo at her. We're not going to do this. That. But I would, question, I would also say, though, that there are some 80-year-olds who are as fitter than some 60-year-olds as well. Just because they hit that age doesn't mean we say, that's it. I, I do think we do, I, I do think society, do you agree that we do do that a little bit? Because they are a drain on us. We shouldn't be living as, my dad should not be still alive, bless him. He's like the bionic man. Just uglier. Um, but these people deserve us to say that they've got a cancer in the mouth and then try and support the staff. But if we'd have caught it earlier, maybe we could have done a different treatment plan for them. Are you following? What did he say? There's a slide missing, actually. I've just realised from the second. There's two, two, every, um, two in three mouth cancers occur in the over 65s. And 50% of older people in care homes have got dental decay. Another important statistic, 70% of care workers in care homes leave in the first two years. 
So it's about training as well, isn't it? Yeah. Unfortunately, Doreen, she won't mind me saying it, she passed away. Um, and we all were running around because they'd never seen a mouth cancer before in this care home. But they're going to see more and more because it is on the rise. This is a case study. Older, vulnerable, medically compromised female living in a care home, immobile, fully dependent on care providers, couldn't speak, no oral care being provided at all. They should not be left like this. It just, I get quite upset when I see it's neglect as far as I'm, you know, safeguarding should be put in as far as I'm concerned. Because if she was sat in her own whatever, things would be done. But why is that? That's impacting on absolutely everything in her life. Um, discussion was about lubrication and cleaning the lips and oral cavity. Mandy put a care plan in place. Four days later, she's looking like that. This is just your gels. She's, we, we, we lubricated the tongue. We brushed with a non-foaming toothpaste. Four times a day, speaking to them... The, the, the GP said, oh, coarse still mouthwash. She couldn't use coarse still mouthwash. So what did we change it to? Coarse still gel. She used it as a toothpaste, little things like that. And that lady, she just looks, it just looks healthier. She can smile. She couldn't smile. That one, she, it's, uh, it's not on. Really not on. So I'm nearly, I'm nearly done, by the way. Um, we've also put together, anybody who's been to the stands will know about these oral care guides that we've done. And um, we're going to get, Wales want them translating into their, their um, dialect and their language. Um, <laughs> basically, they're a guide to tell the, it goes on about conditions in the mouth. So what I wanted to do was have, you know, for tissue viability, have got little guides that are on their, ke on their trolleys and they look and they go, oh, that could be a grade one or whatever. That one is for the care homes and for care staff. And I have also done one for oncology. So anybody who works within oncology... I, my bugbear was grading oral mucositis because I don't think they grade oral mucositis. I use the WHO system. So basically, it's telling you what grading it is. I'm not asking them to diagnose off it, but it gives them an idea of what to do. But it, we should be having guides on, on oral mucositis. Um, these are free. They're not product... Nothing to do with products in them. They are on the supply chain. Um, but I might, be, I might be able to get somebody to fund printing these out because I think they're a really good tool just to sit on the ward and people can and refer to them. So please, if anybody wants them, just come and see them, and I'll get the PDF emailed over to you, but they are on the supply chain as a resource. We also did head and neck pathways because we realised that if somebody had a suspected head and neck cancer, there was no... The doctor wouldn't see them because the doctor said it was the dentist to do, and the dentist wouldn't see them, because and in the middle is this person who cannot get any help. Actually, I think that happens in general. Actually, they don't need to be in a care home setting. So we've done a pathway, head and neck pathway referrals. That'll be on the, on the mouth cancer website. I also did one for oncology as well because there's some elderly who've had breast or any other cancers that's affected their mouth and their oral care is really important. We forget, I'm not just here for head and neck really today. I'm talking about all cancers because they can affect the mouth. Some of you might have had a breast or, as well as a mouth cancer. You could have had different mouth cancers. They'll have all butchered your mouth. That's a lovely term. Um, but I think the district nurses should know about these people and be supporting them with their oral care moving forward. So we've done a pathway for that as well. This is the video. It's a world exclusive.
the picture for the Mouth Cancer Foundation. <laughs> Call it up. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, that took a day to film, believe it or not, and it was a nightmare. Do you like his acting, Peter? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> It was excellent, and it was really important to us that we got actually a carer to do the majority of it. It's dead simple. You've probably not learned anything, but they needed it because they're getting ignored. Um, oh, we don't want it again. I know I'm attractive, but we don't want it again. Uh, by working together, we're all doing our best to make a difference to dental health for the older persons living in our UK care homes. They're not going away. <laughs> I love them. We're all, hopefully, we'll, we'll all be like them at some point in our lives. Care homes are hospices. Think of it like that. That's their place that they're going to die. And I always say, we're all palliative. It's a great talk, this now. It's gone dead depressing, hasn't it? <laughs> <clears throat> they're all palliative. We're all palliative. We do not know when our time is up. So we live life to the full, but they want to live there. The, some of them are very cheap. Look at his acting. I mean, Spielberg could have got him. He's brilliant, Peter. Uh, but and he loved it. And do you know what? He went, anything that will get us looked at, at the same as you. I'll film, film me all day. Yeah, so that was what, that was really, it's really good. I'm really proud of it, actually. Please tweet it <coughs> in a bit. And just to finish off, <coughs> some of you might have heard my poem that I wrote for mouth cancer. It's not really a poem, it's just a ditty, really. And this is how I'll sign off. I'm, I think I'm early. Let me introduce myself. My name is Mouth Cancer. I'm not as well known as me other brothers and sisters in our family, but I'm no less dangerous. Sometimes I will call on you without notice, but in some cases I'll give you an idea that I'm going to visit. The legacy of my visit will often linger with you and your family for years to come, even though some very clever and caring professionals will try and help you move on and try and forget me. I can be a bit stubborn. Although not invited, I am the guest at every meal you ever take. I'll dictate what you eat and whether you'll enjoy it. I'll decide if you go out for that special meal or that night out with the girls. That might not happen. Just a dry mouth, one of the things I'll leave you with after I've been. And red wine might be a problem for you moving on. <laughs> Some of you are nodding already. <clears throat> My visit also touches your family and friends too. Although they don't want to, they may look at you differently after I've gone. But my shadow will always remain if you let it. I am the third party in your marriage or relationship. Whenever you kiss your partner, it will be me you're thinking of, sometimes not them. And finally, if you let me, I'll, I'll dictate whether you smile or not. Because when you do smile, you will always be thinking of me and whether people can still see where I visited you. Of course, those clever people I mentioned will try and stop my visit if you let them. And they will help you erase my memory. But only if you visit them before I visit you. That's me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Got quite, yeah. And you thought Tommy was a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's plenty of questions. I think we've got five minutes or so, is that right? I should have run over more. Can uh, I keep the microphone? I know they'll be from here. I could <laughs> <laughs> Stop it now. <laughs> Hello. Can Hiya. You? I'm Sam. I'm a speech and language therapist. Oh, hello. <laughs> I'm glad I said you were all right, you lads. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'll pay you later. <laughs> pay you later. <laughs> Thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. It was fantastic. And it's more a, um, a comment as opposed to a question. We, we go on about mouth care all the time, you know, but when we see our patients. And sometimes, yes, it can be neglected, but also some patients that don't have teeth. Yes. And so we actually can find people that don't have teeth well, why do we need to clean their mouth? So really, and that's just so important. It's a really good point. And, and also with dementia, people. so when somebody comes in who's, we say, edentulous, it's a posh word for the teeth have gone, sometimes they are treated differently because they perceive they weren't really interested in the mouth because all the teeth have gone. So they are cleaned. They leave them to it. And there is this common thing that if somebody's got no teeth, they don't need to do anything in there. It's the complete and utter opposite. What we always say is this is skin. And the skin goes right the way down and comes out the other end. You make sure that your skin is looked after and the patient's skin, the integrity of the skin is looked after. Just because there's no teeth in there anymore doesn't mean that we don't do that. Dentures are a nightmare. <laughs> no. Dentures are harder 
to look after the normal teeth in some cases. And also, it's a really good point. We've got dent you'll have dental implants down here because you're really posh. You can afford them down here. Um, but we're getting dental implants now, the dentures that click in and click out and fixed dentures that need looking at, um, implants that need looking after. We have to still look after the mouth regardless of what's in there. And uh, but ultimately, it's their gob. It's their mouth. Have you seen some... I, the, the nicest bloke I've got with a bit, the best smile in the world, he's got no teeth. He's gorgeous. <laughs> what a smile he's got. So it is so important still to look after that. It's a really good point. Still to look after their mouth if they've got no teeth. And even if they've got one tooth, held on to it. And, sorry, you'll carry on. Do a no, I don't know. I've got to go now. I need a brew. <laughs> My Kerry Morgan. Testing. I can hear you. This one. <laughs> it was what you said about dementia patients not being able to spit always. Yes. We've had a number of our patients who've had oral surgery that, again, tell us they struggle to spit. And I wondered, is Durafat a foaming toothpaste? Yes, or is it is. It, is it available in non-foaming? No, it's a good point. And um, it's something that all the companies will have looked at because we, there's a, there's, there are toothpaste out there that are low in mint and flavourless. So they're great, but they've not got... So they've got 1450 in. We need either 2,800 or the 5,000. Because it's, it's a medicine, Jurafat, to take the SLS... This is what I've been told by the manufacturers. To take the SLS out, it wouldn't disperse around the mouth. So the foaming agent, it, it, it's a detergent, and its job is to disperse it around your mouth. Yeah? So if they've got a dry mouth as well, which whatever tooth you land it on first, it's going to get all that fluoride. Yeah, and then it'll get. Uh, the more you're brushing it, it'll all disperse. It won't disperse around the mouth. So they are looking in if they could do an SLS-free jaw of that. But we would have done it by now if we if we could. But I think they will in the future. But it's 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 going to be difficult. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for asking questions because I thought I was rubbish. Hello, um, I'm Jenny, I'm a dietitian. Uh, yeah. um, thank you very much for thank giving you. us the premiere of your well, uh, video as well. Well, it's world premiere, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> so after the world premiere, I was wondering, will it be available for us to share? Because yes. we have, um, so I work in the hospital, but I've got community colleagues um, who work in dietetics and work training nursing homes to help support their patients with Brilliant. nutrition and hydration. I'm just thinking this would be a great add-on for them. Thank you. Um, to kind of support in that way as well. Go on YouTube. Don't put in YouTube Emma Riley because other videos come up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the link, um, if you go on the Mouth Cancer website, it's there. And you're all going to put a comment of how good I was as well, aren't you? For the Mouth Cancer Foundation. But if you go on their website, the, the link's there. And they've actually put a bit of a spiel about it. And there's links for Teeper at the bottom of showing how to do hand over hand brushing and the Alzheimer's Society. One thing before I go, because I'm going now, because I'm not at a brew. Um, I did the mouth, I did the mouth, I cleaned the mouth of somebody who died because um, the coroner wasn't, in, everything was sorted. Um, this young lad had had his um, organs harvested um, and I cleaned his mouth with a non-foaming toothpaste, lubricated his mouth and off again. Anyway, they brought the mum in and um, the mum said, his mouth looks clean. And so they said, who's done his mouth? So Daft Man Cunin in the corner said, it's me here. Hello. So she said, thank you. She said, um, see that tooth there? That was his first filling. And he sort of straight away, you can feel yourself starting to fill up. Because that's, that's her boy. That's her boy. And she said, I was the first person to kiss those lips. I'm going to be the last. And because you've lubricated him, I can do that. That's what the mouth means, doesn't it? That's what it is. I don't kiss anybody these days, but I've got great spit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> but that's what, that's all I'm trying to say is, it's not complicated, this is it, in a sense. Just please keep that, <laughs> please keep that mouth clean. Thank you for having me. I'm going back to Manchester later. <laughs> Oh, that was fantastic. I think, are you... You can do it. I, you do, you, it's about time you... Should we lower the lectern? Oh, that's not... Can you hear me? I 
Yeah. I haven't got a mic on, but I've got this on. Um, yeah, it's really lovely to see you all back and even more people today. So, um, yeah, and I've just realised the time. So I think Tommy Walsh might have got his message by now. So, um, yeah, great. Just to point out... I think, time. No, well, in an, in an hour and five minutes, there'll be a fire alarm. Oh, OK. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> so we'll find out where the fire exits are. I don't think we have I to I reckon move. that if it way. it carries on, get, way, yeah, and the air that way. <laughs> from up there. Yeah. Um, so ne- our next two guests, we've got um, Mr. Sean Singham from Torbay Hospital and Tams and Langley from the Royal Marsden. Am I audible? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I'd first like to thank the Swallows team for giving us this opportunity to share uh, what we do at Tobe with acupuncture and radiotherapy and xerostomia. And also for putting together this meeting, which is a really terrific format where you bring in patients, <clears throat> healthcare professionals, researchers, and with the purpose of improving quality of life, which frequently sort of overlooked or sort of taken for granted. So it's great. And we've heard all these great talks so far. And yesterday we heard all the latest advances, AI in speech, gene therapy, <coughs> and xerostomia. But my topic today is quite rudimentary. It's sort of taking you back in time. It's quite controversial, but intriguing. And a lot of familiar faces here who have heard me waffle, so please bear with me if you're... It's a lot of repeats here. Uh, I'm going to just give you a brief outline of acupuncture, and I'll see it there, and what we do at Tobe. Okay. So it's a little team, myself and the head and neck nurses there, and a lot of you have had acupuncture, and all of you have heard of acupuncture. So basically, it's a procedure where you use needles to manipulate them to for therapeutic purposes. And the word actually strangely, strangely is derived from Latin, okay? And we don't know when it all started <clears throat> because there are paintings in caves where they've had sharp stones which suggest they've used it for therapeutic purposes. So it's a bit of a, yeah. But if you look at it more realistically, we know it all started in China at about four to, four to 5,000 years back when during the Bronze Age and Iron Age. And it's strange, the history in China is quite strange, where during the 200 to 300 BC, uh, there was a textbook written, the Yellow Emperor's Classic Internal Medicine textbook, which covered TCM. TCM is traditional Chinese medicine. And then it gradually built up, and during the Tang and Song dynasties, that's between 600 and 1200 AD, it reached its peak. <clears throat> where there were more than 90 textbooks written. All the meridians were point, and the points were marked out. And then gradually modern medicine started creeping in. And then acupuncture was banned in China. <clears throat> By 1822, it was banned. And then with Mao Zedong, you know, when the Communist Party took over in the 1940s, he wanted to <clears throat> resurrect or revive classic ancient Chinese techniques of various things. So he brought back TCM, and from then it took off. And in the West, really, it took off 50s, 60s, 70s, and now there's no looking back. Apparently, I don't know how true this is, acupuncture, it's a $50 billion industry, which sounds a bit over the top, but that's what the figures say. So if you look at acupuncture, there are two types. One is traditional Chinese medicine, which parts, forms a part of TCM, where they look at it very differently. It's all about energy meridians flowing down the body, and it's balancing up these forces, and yin and yang. It's more simplistic, but modern medicine doesn't understand that. At least we can't find energy meridians flowing. There's a lot of research that's been done, but they can't find anything. 
So this chap, Felix Mann, who was a German acupuncturist, he came up with this uh, scientific acupuncture or medical acupuncture, which is based on dermatomes, your nerve supplies, and sort of something that we could understand. And the treatment is completely different. TCM treats the patient as a whole, whereas tr medical acupuncture treats the symptom. Okay, so it's very different the number of needles you use and how you look at it. And of course, the fascinating thing is we really don't know how it works. Okay, so there's lots of theories, like you see, there's a gate control theory. And as you all know, it's fantastic for chronic pain. So there's <clears throat> the gate control theory talks about that, and there's an interplay between the ent intrinsic and extrinsic pathways, release of endorphins, that sort of thing. The other one is the neurohormonal theory, which actually there's been a lot of studies in Sweden and stuff where they've actually found neuropeptides being released during acupuncture sessions or in between your sessions, which we'll come to in a bit. <clears throat> so coming to the radiation-induced xerostomia, it's... The xerostomia post-radiotherapy is such a big issue for patients after the initial treatment. And we don't really realize how big a deal it is until you actually start talking to them. And as you see, 90% of the patients have a problem with conventional radiotherapy. These days with IMRT, that's intensity modulated radiotherapy, which in the last 10, 15 years has become the norm, it's probably less, the percentage is less, but still we're getting as many patients coming in. But we haven't done a formal study comparing the two, but we think they sort of tend to respond a bit earlier. And <clears throat> 60 to 75 percent, you can see the figures there, are left with the long-lasting xerostomia, and it really affects the quality of life. And you should talk to the patients where you realize every simple things like you know, eating out, going out for a meal, socializing, everything is an issue because it's all about eating, chewing, tasting. And it's something, it's like a life sentence, but you all bravely endure it. <clears throat> the pathophysiology, again, it's radiation is, the salivary cells are so sensitive that within a week of radiotherapy, the first week, 50 to 60% of salivary flow drops. There's a drop, and then that continues and there's cellular necrosis, inflammation, and, uh, the, and as you can see, the severity depends on the field. And with head and neck cancer, pretty much all your salivary glands come into the field of radiation. And with the IMRT, what happens is the way the beams are directed, there's more protection. So it's a bit softer on the salivary glands. <clears throat> um, and of course, with loss of saliva, you get all your additional problems. The lubrication is lost, the enzymatic protection is lost, so there's more decay and caries. <laughs> and in the market, there's a lot of salivary substitutes, as you've seen in the stands and as you hear, and which are all useful. Amifostine was an interesting one because it's a radio protector, and that came in, and there was a lot of interest initially because but the hassle was every time before each session, you need an IV infusion, so it protects the cells. But then there were concerns whether it's protecting tumor tissue and stuff, so that sort of wore off. Pilocarpine is there, it's useful, and some of you have tried it, I know. But it's got side effects, quite a lot of side effects. So that brings us to acupuncture. This all started back in 2003 here at Tobe, so it's a good 20 years, time flies. Uh, one of the patients actually asked Julie Hewitt then, who was the head and neck nurse, about acupuncture. I had just come back from a little course. And then we said, okay, why don't we just look it up? And there were these two studies. One was Johnston et al. from California, and a Swedish study by Blom. So these guys, these teams have done quite a lot of good work. <clears throat> and the Santiago division, basically, they, they did a study. They did 50 patients, and they found 70% of them improved. It was a more simple, straightforward one. The Swedish group had done a lot of actual measurements. They measured salivary flow, they measured neuropeptide release, the epidermal growth factors, and they found all of that were increasing and helping. And they thought actually it may actually, the salivary glands tissues may be regenerating actually. We sort of followed the American one because <clears throat> it was simpler, less needles on you, 
and you didn't have to take off your shirts and stuff. It was more simple. So we sort of followed that. And our regime, basically, you have four weekly sessions. It's really important that the patients come for all those four sessions. And at, after which they get a one-month gap, and they're reviewed at week eight. So, and at that stage, if there's some improvement, any improvement, little, or then we carry on with our long-term. They go on to a long-term regime. If at eight weeks there's no improvement at all, then they're discharged because it's not going to work for you. And as with everything, you know, it works. It, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And the long-term regime, what happens is we go on to then mo three monthly sessions and then three, three monthly sessions. And 80, 85% of our patients settle at six monthly sessions. You find acupuncture for chronic ailments, you need a sort of a booster. And it works really well. So, as I was saying, most of our patients are at six monthly. Some patients are very stable. They go on to nine months or yearly sessions. Some patients find six months too long, so we shrink it down. Once they've reached that stage, then we shrink it down to four months or three months, depending on how bad they are. So we line you all up, and once all the target practice is done, so we kick off the sessions. And you have three needles on each year, so all of them get the same points, okay? And one on each forefinger, so that's standard. So we give it a bit of a wipe with alcohol wipes. You don't need to, but because we're going into the year uh, sort of to avoid infections, we do that. What we do is superficial acupuncture. With acupuncture, you have superficial or deep. And the deep ones are more for pain when you're going in for your backache and uh, when you're going into the muscle. And sometimes you can, when you go on the courses, there's something called periosteal pecking, where you can go right down to your periosteum, and it's really scary because you have to do it on each other, so it's hard going. <laughs> but ours is pretty straightforward, superficial. It, the needles stay in for 30 minutes, and when the needles are in, we give them a sugar-free sweet in the mouth. So that helps, what the studies found is it helps sort of activate the salivary glands, sort of tickle them along. And that's when we started off, we did group sessions of four to five patients. So that was in 2004 or something, that shot. And that's actually here at the nursing system. We started it together then. Uh, then COVID came. And then what happened is now we do three patients at a time, you know, with a two meter. We sort of space them out. And it sort of works well. So we do three patients at a time. The evidence, as you heard Mike saying yesterday, with saliva, unless you're measuring salivary, salivary flow, it's really hard. It's all subjective. It's based on what you say, what you feel. Measuring salivary flow is really hard. Am I out of time? Or? <clears throat> and, it, you know, the cup over the duct slip and all that. So it's a bit of a, we used to do it in Ireland for something else, but it doesn't really work. So it's all subjective. And you can see, if you read all the different quotes of patients, how they found it. You know, some of them, they started tasting food better, and chocolate and wine are very, very hard going. So that works sometimes. And they start, social, they get more confident, they can socialize better. And one of the, the third line there, the chap, he was our sort of star patient in the sense he was 10 years post, and he'd had a double dose of radiotherapy, this is early 90s or late 80s, for parotid tumors, and we still couldn't find out why he had a double dose. You know, like, that's, yeah, pretty over the top. But he was bone dry, okay? And so he wanted to give it a shot, and we thought, yeah, nothing to lose. And when we started, we didn't even know if it's going to work or not. So he started it, and then his dentist noticed his mouth was getting moister, and he was asking him what's going on. And so that was reassuring for us, like dentists were starting to notice that these patients were getting a bit more saliva. And he said after all these years he could eat his favorite ham and mustard sandwich, and his, he was a happy bunny. So <clears throat> there are some interesting things that we observed over the last 20 years, like when some patients develop a bit of a runny nose before the saliva kicks in, which sort of makes us think it's sort of these needles affect the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So it's guess we still really don't know. And any intercurrent illness, so, so suppose someone gets like, they start improving and they're on the long-term pathway, they get a dental infection, UTI, respiratory infection, it drops down, the scores drop down. And then as they recover, it jumps back up. It's strange. 
Smokers, anyone who's continued smoking has never really improved, and we've sort of had to discharge most of them. Some of them try, say, they hang in their borderline, but then it doesn't really work. And as I was saying, we don't really know how it works, so it's more simpler to just think of yin and yang and keep it simple. So we did an audit and some patient satisfaction studies because, you know, with the current state of funding, etc., there's always a risk of services being pulled. So we looked, this was done back in 2015, uh, yeah, where we had about 150 patients. So I won't go through all the numbers because of time, but basically what our gold standard was the Johnston et al. paper back in 2001 and they sort of had about 70% of the patients improving. When we did our audit, we sort of found about 80% who went through, we'll go through those numbers later. If you have doubts, just ask me later. But about 80% improved. Some improve a little, some improve a lot. And so the audit gang said, your results were better than the gold standard. So you don't, the audit cycle was closed. So normally, you know, you look at it, you repeat your audit and all that sort of stuff. So it was done. And the range of improvement, this gives you a snapshot. Yeah, this gives you a snapshot of what actually happens. This is about 60 patients, and each is one. And the red marks day one, the VASCOs. So we measure it by VASCOs. So we ask the patient, how dry are you from a scale of 0 to 10? Okay, so, and we ask them to measure it against their normal pre-radiotherapy levels. So they give us a score. So the red is when they start your acupuncture. The yellow is taken at week eight, and the white is at 12 months. So it's not like it improves and keeps on improving. There's nothing like that. So it gets better, and then everyone reaches a sort of a plateau, and to keep that plateau going, you need those top-ups. And COVID was a revelation for us, and you know, sometimes you know, there's all this talk about placebo, this thing, whether it's actually happening or not. But COVID showed us actually a lot of the patients started because we had to shut down the service for about nine months to a year. And patients were really starting to feel the difference when we were, there was no acupuncture top-ups. So they started ringing in. So actually the management who were planning to ax the whole service were almost forced to tell us, no, when are you starting it back? So, uh, and that's just an average score or cohort. Now we have about 316 patients, obviously, not all of them are with us. And to summarize, basically, so it's a relatively non-invasive thing. It's simple. It either works or it doesn't work. So, and, you know, if you look at all the, the audit results, the patient satisfaction score, everything looks good. So there's no real reason why we presented this in London and Liverpool in the cancer research uh, thing, uh, session. But it's not caught on. People have come and seen what we do. They've gone back and tried to set it up, but funding is a huge problem. And the moment you say you want to set up something and there's a cost involved, and especially if it's complementary medicine, so they say there's not even enough money for the normal sort of stuff we do. And so when we started it, we actually did it in our own time. And talking of Macmillan nurses, we had, Julie had a fund of from Macmillan nurses, so we bought needles from that and we did it at lunchtime. And it's only when the results started coming in, they sort of couldn't say no, and then they gave us the session. And then, yeah, so that's how it goes. So looking at it in future, I think, personally, if head and neck nurses get trained up, if one in your team gets trained up, then there's not much issue with employing someone else, an acupuncturist who has to come and all that sort of stuff. You can get it going in departments because it's simple enough. And I think in Santiago, once they did that initial study, they made acupuncture part of the service. It's a part. So when they talk to patients, they also say at the end of this, this is available. So it's become an essential part of the head and neck team. So yeah, we should be looking into that. So either we organize it properly or we sort of go to Jimmy's. <laughs> Thank you.
ready to go. Hi, um, my name's Tamsin. I am one of the occupational therapists at the Royal Marsden Hospital, and today I'm going to be talking about cancer-related cognitive impairment. So just a brief overview of what we're talking about today is the prevalence and characteristics of what we call cancer-related cognitive impairment, or commonly known as CRCI, uh, the mechanisms and assessing for CRCI, as well as just some um, research-based recommendations and management strategies for you to take home today. So I guess um, what the first question is, is what actually is cancer-related cognitive impairment or commonly known as chemo brain or brain fog. Um, so over the last few decades, a body of research um, has emerged confirming what many adults um, with non-central nervous system cancer have long reported, and that is the cancer and the treatment are frequently associated with cognitive impairment. The severity of CRCI varies, um, and the symptoms can emerge early or late in the disease course. And it typically um, tends to um, impair attention, memory, so whether that's verbal memory or working memory, processing speed or executive functioning. So we see a lot of patients who um, struggle um, with their memory, obviously, uh, with word finding difficulties, struggle to pay attention for long periods of time, um, struggle with things like divided attention and multitasking. I'm seeing a few nods in the audience. Um, and just completing tasks that um, they usually found um, quite um, easy. And we'll go into that in a little bit further depth. So how many patients does it affect? The research is still quite young. It's only a few decades. But up to 75% of patients experience um, cancer-related cognitive impairment in some form or other. Um, for most, it does resolve after treatment. But up to 35% are experiencing long-term difficulties. Um, although it does tend to be mild to moderate in its presentation, it does have a severe impact, or it can have a severe impact on an individual quality of life. So we're seeing a lot of people struggling to, to return to work, to be able to engage in social activities because divided attention is quite difficult. So following the thread of a conversation or maybe being in a busy restaurant, having noise in the background makes it difficult to follow the thread of a conversation. Um, looking after family members as well. We have, I've had a number of patients who've flooded the bathroom a number of times. Um, someone who said that they've got into a car and they were sort of bombing it down the motorway and then could, suddenly couldn't remember why they got in their car or where they were going. So it can be really terrifying for patients. Um, and what the sort of long-term fear is that, you know, that, that what they might be... If, sort of experiencing is sort of early onset dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Um, on that note, it isn't a de degenerative disorder, um, so that if um, it does continue to decline, it's worth talking to your um, medical team about it because it should sort of plateau after um, treatment has finished. Um, again, the research is really young. We don't know exactly what causes um, cancer-related cognitive impairment, but what we do know from the research is that there are a number of factors that can have an impact. So the tumour itself, um, so you can see on the left-hand side here, things like socioeconomic def demographics, so things like age and cognitive reserve and genetics can also play a factor. Um, and we also know that treatments um, have an impact. It was initially coined chemo brain, but we do know from the research now that more pa patients are coming forward and saying, well, actually, I never had chemotherapy and still experience these symptoms. And there's a small, very small body of research to do with head and neck cancers, to do with sort of radiation um, and sort of the, the proximity to the temporal lobe, which can impact um, memory and learning. Um, but there are also a number of factors that we do have some control over that we know impact cognition. So if you see in the sort of bottom right here, so things like anxiety, stress, exercise, sleep, um, inflammation in the body tends to be a big factor, um, we think, um, which we will talk about a little bit more when we come to the sort of interventional side of things. How do we assess for CRCI? Again, um, there is no standard assessment specific to, for CRCI. Um, there is a lot of neuropsychological testing that is, is commonly done in the States. Um, however, patients tend to score well within the normal ranges. Um, so 
using standard reported, uh, self-reported instruments um, such as the FactCog V3, um, which was specifically designed um, to assess cognitive difficulties with cancer survivors seems to be sort of the most effective in getting, in getting um, the outcomes that we need. Um, this is actually just a, a nice image um, that kind of explains sort of the inner workings of what might be going on. Um, it isn't a head and neck study. What this is, is um, it's twins. Um, it's, it's a twin A. So the, the twin at the top, um, three images, had breast cancer. And she underwent chemotherapy. And twin B, with the bottom at the bottom here, um, did not have cancer at all. And what they did was they did put the twins through an fMRI scanner, and they asked them to do an, a battery of neuropsychological tests. To the outside world, um, both twins got almost identical results. Um, but as you can see, twin A here is using about twice the amount of brain power to achieve exactly the same result. I'm seeing nods, which, is, which sort of echoes exactly what patients report, that actually they can get the job done, but it, it feels like it takes twice the amount of effort to get there. So it's quite validating for patients to be able to see this image and go, yes, that's actually exactly me. I've, you know, writing an email used to take me five minutes, and now it takes me an hour to get there in the end. Um, so how do we manage or improve the symptoms of cancer-related cognitive impairment? Um, again, the, the, the research is still very young and ongoing, um, but the most effective so far is physical activity and sort of behavioral interventions. So from research, physical activity has shown to have an improvement in processing speed and reduction in cognitive symptoms and behavioral interventions, which generally tends to focus on education, cognitive behavioral therapy, teaching compensatory and sort of rehabilitatory strategies, um, are sort of the most um, effective. Um, and cognitive behavioral therapy and cognitive um, rehabilitation studies in cancer survivors consistently report improvements in cognitive complaints as well. In addition, there is sort of ongoing research into sort of other interventions such as sort of pharmacological interventions, so things like psychostimulants, but again at the moment nothing has yet been approved. So an intervention that I just wanted to talk a little bit about today, it's an example of one of the interventions that are currently being used um, and we are using at the Marsden Hospital is the Emerging from the Hayes Programme. It was initially built at Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles by the brilliant Dr. Arash Asher, and he has very generously licensed the program to us. Um, and what I've done is I've adapted it to fit a sort of UK NHS setting. Um, the program, it's online, it's in a group setting, and it's a psycho, what we call a psychoeducational series. So what we do is we look at the areas that you have some control over. So things like stress, um, mood, exercise, sleep, nutrition, and we also look into attention and memory as well, and we really go into the science behind it, so understanding why is it that when you become stressed, why does that change your cognition, and it, that really empowers patients to giving them a bit of understanding of what's going on in their body as well, because I know that for a lot of patients, they have a lot of things done to them, but they don't get a lot of knowledge and empowerment back, so it's about empowering patients with the knowledge, and then hopefully um, then be able to take on those interventions and management strategies that we suggest over the weeks. Um, and then we send them all homework that they can, they can do each week and then beyond that, be able to take on their own rehabilitation beyond the six weeks. Um, so we've been now running the program for two years, which has um, been really wonderful. Um, and we've had really um, encouraging data. We've been take it using the FactCog, the self-reported outcome measure, pre and post intervention. Um, and um, what you can see here from the graph is that um, there is a reduction in, in the cognitive symptoms. Um, so at the beginning, up to 24% of patients had what could be classified as clinically significant cognitive impairment. Um, and um, following the program, um, we noticed that there was a reduction in symptoms which demonstrated a meaningful clinically important difference. Patients also reported that they really valued the experience of the course and it had been beneficial um, 
to their lives, both psychologically and socially as well. So we also wanted to follow that up with a focus group. So we did that with seven patients. And um, some of the themes that emerged um, were patients reported that um, seeking help for the problem with CRCI had been difficult. It's a common experience that clinicians don't necessarily routinely ask about CRCI in cancer care, and knowledge and information has helped patients to feel confident to address this with their healthcare teams. Um, they also reported a positive psychological um, impact in participating in the course, improving feel feelings of isolation, distress, and increasing feelings of hopefulness. This is something that we're not very good about talking about when um, we talk about the symptoms of um, the, the side effects of cancer. We know that, you know, I think one of the things that sort of comes to mind is things like hair loss, nausea when people talk about cancer, but what we don't talk about enough is um, the cognitive side effects, which can be terrifying to patients if they're not um, sort of expecting it. Um, one of the sort of best outcomes as well is that patients reported that they were at able to adapt to occupational situations. Um, so a few people have, we've had a number of patients emailing us in just to say, by the way, just to let you know, I've gone back to work now, whether it's part-time or full-time, being able to engage in social settings. Um, one of my, um, the participants has um, started up her own business. So we've had lots of really, really great outcomes. Um, and they were also helped to relate symptoms to members of the family who may not have understood um, the symptoms before. We also also asked for some sort of suggestions on improving the program. Um, it's very condensed into six weeks. We cover a lot in six weeks. Um, so they were the suggestions were to add more sessions, um, add discussion sessions, and um, shortened time because obviously attention is a problem, and we are trying to cover quite a lot in a short period of time. Um, now, I appreciate that um, the Marsden is, I think, one of the only hospitals that are running interventions for cancer-related cognitive impairment. I am working on that with my, one of my colleagues, Dr. Sarah Stapleton, in trying to pilot the Emerging from the Hayes program to other NHS hospitals, so we are in the process of getting funding for that. Um, so what I wanted to leave you with is just some very, very basic quite obvious self-management strategies for you to take home today or be, be able to discuss with your patients as well um, in helping to sort of manage the symptoms of CRCI. So making sure that patients use um, memory aids and devices. I know this seems really obvious, but, um, and people feel that they have become reliant on, on sort of technology nowadays, but we all, we all use technology. Um, so it's really helpful to make sure that you use timers, calendars, family members, uh, making notes, taking a picture of things, using GPS, anything that's going to help um, with remembering things. Also taking time to with for your self-care. We know that, from, that physical activity helps the body, mind and the brain. It improves cognitive functioning and helps overall mood. So we know that what is good for the heart is good for the brain. Um, and research has shown that Tai Chi, Qi Gong, and doing five... 150 minutes of aerobic exercise can improve cognitive dysfunction. Um, also making sure that you have a balanced diet and getting enough rest as well. Um, trying to organize your, ev your environment and your everyday, our body loves routine. So when we have sort of appointments at different, I know that it's quite difficult um, to, to manage in your everyday, but as and when you can, trying to keep things as routine as possible, trying to minimize distractions um, to reduce that sort of divided attention um, and trying to declutter your space, having pill um, dosset boxes, organizers, all of those things as well. And making sure that you take um, care of your sort of mental fatigue. I know that probably a number of patients will have experienced um, some or severe um, fatigue for during or after treatment. So making sure that you do activity, restorative activities, because becoming overwhelmed can obviously exacerbate the symptoms of CRCI. Um, making sure that you pace yourself throughout the day and through the week. It will not only help manage your fatigue, but it will also help cognitively as well, because it will prevent that sort of overload that happens. And again, stress, 
noise and mess reduction will help with that divided attention. So just being able to focus on one task at a time rather than sort of having a, a cluttered desk with loads of different things that we don't even think about, but actually that can have a real impact on our attention as well. So minimizing all of those things as well. And just some tips and strategies just to help improve memory and concentration. Repetition is key. Um, we do know that from learning at school, um, but it really does. And even saying, and saying things out loud is very good because it'll help um, sort of instill that in our, in our brain as well. So do it, if you feel silly doing it, just know that it's going to be good for you. Just say things out loud. Um, try and avoid multitasking. I know that that's very normal for all of us to try and do things um, all at once, but actually it's not going to help you long term. So try and do one task at a time. Socializing is going to help mood, but it is also going to help um, with your memory and your attention as well, and being able to challenge yourself as well cognitively. Try and do things that you're interested in, um, because we know that um, just from research and just in life, that the things that you are going to be more interested in, you're going to likely engage in more often as well. So tr if you, you know, if there's, you know, um, let's say you've been interested in taking up French again or learning the piano again, all of those things are going to be really great for your learning um, and for your memory and for your attention. So do take up that language or, or cooking you know, that, that sort of cooking class that you've been meaning to do, all of those things are going to be great um, for your memory and for your attention. So just in summary, um, CRCI can affect up to 75% of patients. It tends to be typically mild to moderate in its presentation and non-degenerative. However, it can last years after treatment and impact an individual's quality of life. We don't know the exact causes, but we know that there are a combination of factors, some of which we have um, a great amount of control over that can help manage and improve those symptoms. Um, and with that, cognitive rehab and compensatory strategies and exercise as sort of the current interventions really available. Um, and that's, that's me done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tamsin. Thank you, Sharm. Can you hear me? Because I feel a bit echoey. Um, yeah, it was really interesting talk. Tamsin, I've just got a quick question. I know we'll ask questions on the floor in a second, but a lot of the symptoms that you were describing with the CR. CI, um, they present during treatment. Do you think as when nurses and speech and language therapists and dietitians in our clinic are doing those assessments while patients are on treatment, if we were addressing those symptoms from being on treatment would lessen the risk of developing that at a, at a kind of at a larger degree absolutely at a later time absolutely and it's just having those conversations with patients as well so that just um just to make patients feel heard i think one of the big outcomes of the program is just knowing that patients are not alone so having those you know conversations with patients that normalizing crci um you know, up to uh, what I didn't mention is, is again, the, the research is quite young, but up to 30% of patients experience cognitive um, changes even prior to treatment starting. So um, uh, they're having those conversations very early on can really help um, the outcomes with patients. Because one of, you know, your strategies are exercising and moving. You know, fatigue, that battle of being motivated to exercise when you're already feeling fatigued yeah. is quite difficult to get across to patients I think at times so Absolutely. how do you do that and it to be effective the uh, getting patients yeah, to be pa motivated yeah. To, yeah. to exercise I think well on the program I think one of the benefits is is once once they understand the underpinnings of why exercise is so good I think then it motivates them to then get back into it I think it's also the type of exercise that patients sort of engage in um, what your exercise tolerance pre-treatment is going to be different to post-treatment and it's about engaging in exercises that patients enjoy so you know typically patients think oh well I've got then I've got to go to the gym or I've got to run and I hate running um, so it's about having conversations about what's enjoyable to patients whether that's dancing whether that's taking their dog for a walk even if it's just pushing a hoover around the home um, and then sort of getting two tasks done at once mm. it's it, movement is all exercise so yeah. just um, 
trying to get patients to be kinder to themselves and to think, think they don't have to do a 10k run it you know it can be just something gentle yeah just well, bite and size. then build up yeah great thank you um and Charm, I'm looking forward to hearing what people are going to ask you about acupuncture. I've been sat in that clinic with you for many years now, and I've seen how brilliantly it works. So, um, yeah, yeah, and it does work. I should say, the <laughs> clinic doesn't work without Fahida and Amy there and support from our head and neck surgeons. So it's a team at work. But, it, yeah, it's been a good it's journey great. so far. Yeah, good. Has anyone got any questions? Hello? Can you, yeah, you hear me. Um, it's kind of, it's a, for Mr. Singham really, it's kind of like an echoing of your presentation, which was great. Like, as a service, as you've said, it, we know it works. Um, and actually, the data that you provided shows that it, there's low cost. And actually, our service has expanded. With, uh, with COVID, we knew the negative impact of not having the acupuncture. And actually, we're getting referrals from like Taunton Hospital and now. So as a service in Torbay, we are expanding. There are probably multiple healthcare professionals in the room that are probably wondering why they're not adapting it into their service and may want to look into doing it into their trusts. Um, what advice can you give for them and, on how to set up that service and what support is there out there? That's a tricky one in the sense it's straightforward. I think the biggest problem is the funding issue. So that's what I was thinking. I, I was looking at various options. Like Exeter, what happened is they came, looked at us, went back. But they had to get hire an acupuncturist from outside. And they got someone who's trained in TCM, that's traditional Chinese medicine. So they were putting in 50, 60 needles on each patient. Okay? So it's a different, because they, their principles are different. So, and then within a few months, then they sort of shut it down. They said, oh, it's not cost effective, blah, blah, blah. So the next time someone came around, I was saying, just stick to what we're doing, eight needles, just symptom-oriented, do medical acupuncture. But it's tough. I think the moment you say there's a cost, like if you want a session, you want an acupuncturist, you want, it becomes really tough to argue your case. Uh, for us, it's been easy because we are already in the hospital and we just sort of, and we started doing actually, if we had asked for sessions initially, they probably would have said no. Mm -hmm. It's only because of the results. So I don't really have an answer. I, though it's simple, straightforward enough. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they can come, anyone's welcome to come and see what we do. And I think you start in s little steps. You can, you know, you can get the needles if your patients are willing to try it, start giving them sessions. But I think there'll be an, where you need to give some of your time initially to see and to show that it's sort of making a difference. Because if you go straight away with this, it's really hard. We, we can't basically get basic stuff in the clinic. You know, there's always this stuff of no money, no money, no money. So I don't really have an answer. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> I think your point of training up staff that already exist within the service itself is is possibly an option that could be explored. Uh, and I think most head and neck teams have a few people there. So if you can train up one person, and then if you start implementing it slowly, then it's easy enough because, you know, you can start saying, you know, if you start seeing the results, and then you can argue with management because that's the biggest stumbling block because your head and neck colleagues are supportive, you, your patients are keen, and if you're keen, the problem is, when you want funding for a separate session and stuff like that. And in this day and age, I, I don't know. But it's easy. It's really worth doing. And from a patient point of view, you know, every little helps. So even if it's a one-point improvement, it makes a big difference for them. Uh, Do we have any patients in the room that would like to say they've benefited from it? Oh. <laughs> uh. Can we just answer Steve's question first, and then we'll, yeah. Just reading it. Okay, sorry. Uh, Steve asks, could some of the positive outcomes come from acupuncture also be the individual's own beliefs in its e efficacy? I guess it's possible. And like I was saying, initially, we didn't even know if it's going to work. And so it's a combination of things. One is there are group sessions, right? So you have, there's a bit of counseling there. You talk to each other. You know you're not the only one suffering. And then you've had a lot of patients actually who've started it with no belief in it at all, where they think, gosh, okay, but 
let me just give it a go, and they've transformed, they've changed, and they are surprised themselves, they've changed their minds. So that's encouraging for us, uh, because they've come as non-believers thinking, let me just give it a shot for what it's worth. So I don't know if that answers your question. Or I just think it's, maybe it's one of the reasons why Swallows is here, is to actually be an agitator and else, elsewhere to get this service started up. You know, we can say, but it, in fact, it's, it's when someone outside's being a pain in the ass and going to the MP and things. That's, that's when management is, uh, you know, listens more, is, is when the media and when your local MP, MP says, why aren't you doing that? For whatever reason, you know. Yeah. Uh, things get done strangely enough. Yeah, that's why it'd be great to. Which patient is gonna? Oh, did someone want to say that? The... Yeah. No, Andy. Hi. Um, I've been on the program for a little while, and um, I do feel that, it, particularly the the most recent session um, compared to the one before, that it has made a marked difference. Um, to kind of answer the question about um, whether it's mental or not, I, I will never know whether it's the acupuncture that's made the difference or whether I would have seen this difference just naturally as, as I recovered. Um, but uh, it is perhaps mental. It perhaps I, I was willing to try anything because my mouth was so dry. Um, but if I feel that I've got benefit from it, then I think it's a good thing, and, and I'm presuming that it's, although there's a cost involved, it's not a huge cost compared to a lot of things, and, and comparing it to the outcomes that, that people are actually receiving. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One thing is, initially when we started this, we waited six months post-radiotherapy, and then it was interesting because patients who benefited started complaining, in the sense, in a nice way, saying, why didn't you start this earlier? We've been struggling all along. So then we spoke to the oncology team, and then we sort of worked out, after three months, there's no, the body's not really spontaneously recovering as well. So now we've cut it down to three months. So after three months, minimum three months, and then we can start. But then we've got patients, the whole range, you know, starting two years, three years, four years, that sort of thing, but minimum three months to allow for spontaneous recovery. So that period is, we allow that time. We've got one more question. Yeah, it's about the um, brain fog, or CRCI. So I can relate to that. Um, I had seven weeks of proton beam therapy and chemotherapy, and it was just so obvious afterwards my brain wasn't working as it was. It was a short-term thing, so just instantly forget something, having to write it down all the time, make notes, and I made more mistakes in the sort of 18 months post-treatment than the rest of my lifetime tenfold, and it was so, so noticeable. And I kind of put it down to the treatment, brain fog, and then had a follow up with the Christie after about a year, well, 15 months, and they said, oh, let's get some bloods done. And my folate levels were very low, which was surprising given my diet was high in folic acid. So I was prescribed that, and it did seem to make a difference. So my question to you is, have you come across that in your sort of work and research, kind of testing the bloods and looking for I think it's the B9 levels or, and to make a difference? Because it does seemingly, although I'm still nowhere near pre-treatment yeah it does seem a lot better yeah absolutely um there we do we liaise with the doctors a lot to make sure that and and the sort of cns is to make sure that sort of bloods are done everything is sort of that we can negate all the other sort of effects that can cause um sort of changes in cognitive symptoms um so and, and other members of the mdt as well because things like when patients are in you know, it, with psychological support, we liaise, we liaise with them quite a bit as well because we know that mood can impact cognition as well. But when patients are in that very acute phase of depression, it's not necessarily going to be the best time to, to work with patients for CICI. So actually, it's, it's best to make sure that we work with the MDT, make sure all specialities are sort of looking into the areas that we know impact cognition and optimising them as much as possible. So making sure that obviously their diet is we have a nutritionist, um, a dietitian who, who um, comes and gives a talk on, on nutrition as well, making sure their bloods are, are okay. We, we sort of rule out any other sort of causes of, of cognitive change before then um, they come on the programme. So, yeah, thank you for highlighting that.
Okay, yeah, I think it's worth anyone who's similar to get bloods done. And with, with the folic acid, again, it could be completely nothing to do with this, but my diet was or has been healthy and high in those naturally occurring. But for some reason, whether it's to do with treatment or whatever, they were lower, no, prescribed yeah. the folic acid. And so it might be worth oh, for anyone else. Yeah, thank stuff. you for highlighting that. I think that's really important to bring up. Thank you. What, I think there's time for one more question. Oh. Hello. Um, mine's about acupuncture as well. How, if we want to get into it, and it's something we would like to train in um, to provide as a service, um, I work in um, a dental practice, but it's something that we could possibly do. How do we go about doing the training? Who would we, where do we start to look into doing it? Because obviously it's more a sp specific um, Okay, so area to yeah, train in, but be really there's, interesting. Yeah, there's a Brit British Medical Acupuncture Society. So you go on a course, there's an introductory course, intermediate course, and an advanced course. You basically need the introductory course. Uh, the, the thing is, with the year auricular points, auricular acupuncture, it's sort of covered only in the intermediate course, I think. So basically, you register with them, go on the course, and then you're sort of signed off. You know, there's I think it's got a lot more stricter now, like you have to submit 30 cases that you've done, blah, 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 to get signed off. But then once you're signed off, that's it. You can set it up. Thank you. Yep. I think that's it. So um, thank you. Thanks, Sharm, and thank you, Tamsin. That was great. <laughs> I think it's time for a coffee break now. Um, and what time do we need to be back? It says 10 past 11. What? We'll have a 10 minute warning, apparently. Oh, yes, yeah, so just run out the building. No, don't. <laughs> Thank you. So um, they're quite happy with the fact that they lose appetite, they lose weight, um, but this is obviously has a, an impact on our. Um, treatment pathway, but also in uh, recovery after radiotherapy is finished. Um, nausea also has a, an impact on what we want to eat, uh, the pain in the, the mouth or pain in the throat. We give you lots of supportive medication to try and alleviate these things, many of which will cause constipation, so then we'll give you something else for that. Um, and with all of that, you've got to stack your shelves to make it look like a home pharmacy. We're then very tired at the end of it. But tired beyond tired, it's an exhaustion that I'm sure those that have gone through radiotherapy or um, any other form of uh, surgical intervention will know that it's uh, a fatigue that will not shake. So how can we minimise the effects of toxicity? So 2020, uh, Macmillan released their prehab um, uh, document. Um, I'm a big advocate of prehabilitation. We wouldn't attempt to run a marathon or a half marathon without any training, um, but you'll see your oncologist uh, or you'll be the ones that tell patients that they are yet to go on this journey. And it's going to be six weeks of hell during radiotherapy, and that's just the start of it. Uh, and then you've got months, in fact, years of recovery after that. We wouldn't run a marathon without training. Um, we put a lot of effort into that to physically and nutritionally. Um, and that's the, the main aims of prehabilitation, is getting people physically, mentally and nutritionally ready to take on the, the impact of the treatment and the side effects that we cause. We can also use technology and supportive medication, which I'll go on to talk a little bit more about. So nutrition and hydration. Um, we have a specialist dietitian within our uh, department. We have two, in fact. And we'll push a high calorie, high protein, high fat. Again, we spoke yesterday, a lot of those types of foods are processed. Low sugar. Now, that's the controversial part, which hopefully someone is a dietitian, your dietitian. So low sugar. We apply everybody with 40 sip, high sugar, um, but does that affect, we can go into it later, does that affect the, the mouth, the feeling of the mouth? Does that create a, an acidic environment which then 
makes you have more kind of mucositis, thick, stickier saliva, the things that I'd like to find out about. So if anybody knows the answer, please tell me. Uh, we advise people to eat little and often, so you're not overfaced with food, you're not over full. Um, and this again, sticking with um, pH neutral foods, so low acidity uh, and low um, salty, spicy foods. We modify the texture to make that easier to, to tolerate in the mouth uh, and avoiding alcohol, caffeine, things that are going to dry the mouth out even more. Or presenting, that's quite mouth drying as well. Uh, so exercise, psychological uh, support. Exercise we heard in the, the last talk is very good for the, the mind, very good for the body, just keeps us stimulated. But that's very difficult if you're already very fatigued. Um, so again, it's our role as professionals, uh, support workers, to be able to encourage patients to uh, be able to then exercise within their limits. Um, we know that it can increase survival time, but it also reduces the risk of disease progression if we're overall physically fitter, we're a healthier. Um, poorer fitness is linked with higher symptom burden and reduced um, health-related quality of life. Mortality is 20% higher in patients with prior depression and 90% of those uh, in higher in those with schizophrenia. Uh, a very good friend of mine, an ex-colleague of Kath's, did um, a paper on severe mental health and um, oncology. And the two don't really align, so those patients that do have severe mental health might have barriers to actually accessing cancer care, uh, and that can again severely impact their outcomes or whether they actually have treatment at all. And we know that early intervention, just like training for a marathon, can improve our overall quality of life. Higher stress levels equals a higher mortality rate. And the stat at the bottom, which is quite shocking, the higher suicide rates amongst people diagnosed with cancer, but especially in head and neck cancer. So we use supportive medications as well. I've put water up there because hydration really is the key. Um, one of my colleagues was asking me about um, what uh, emollients we use for patients to reduce um, skin toxicity, and I just use a cheapest chips one, really. Um, hydration and nutrition really are the key uh, to skin integrity during radiotherapy. If we lose weight, then that's when we see uh, a bigger difference because of the way that the radiation interacts um, with skin contours. We'll apply you with some pet pills, but obviously they can cause other side effects. So we can cause the nausea, we can cause vomiting, um, we can cause constipation or diarrhea. Sometimes the supplements can cause those. And again, once we step on the opioid ladder, then it's a one-way ticket to constipation, really. So we talk about technology. Um, so this is a linear accelerator. It's the radiotherapy machine that many of you will have seen. Um, we use intensity modulated radiotherapy, so as the beam moves around the, the patient, we can give a very high tumour dose and as low as possible um, a dose to the surrounding tissue. We can't avoid treating normal tissue. We can minimise it in the best way that we can, um, but we cannot avoid normal tissue. We use image guidance, so every day the patient has their treatment, they'll have a CT scan, make sure that they're in exactly the correct position. Um, but that's only a rigid position, so when you've got soft tissue deformities, when patients are losing weight, we can't correct for that, we have to replan their treatment. So maintaining their weight, their hydration, nutrition during treatment is very important for the accuracy of the, the treatment, and that in turn will reduce the amount of normal tissue that's irradiated. And we all have a customizable shell, uh, a mobilization device, um, which you've seen outside on the table if you've not seen one yourself. Um, and they help to maintain the, uh, a stable treatment position too. So um, the guy, Vladimir, spoke yesterday about um, protons. And again, you can see A and B. A is what we used to use, the standard technique of radiotherapy, blast it one side and then the other. Everything in its path got treated. Um, then we moved on to B, which is the intensity modulation. And you can see there's a what we call a dose wash, so a very high 
um, dose area in the middle around the tonsils where we want to treat and a lower dose but there is a dose to normal tissue that we don't want there we don't need it at the back we don't need it at the front in the oral cavity um, but to get the the overall dose to the tumor that's what we have to do unfortunately with radiotherapy and that's what brings about our side effects so this is um, I'll keep it playing for a second so this is a loop of nine CBCT is a cone beam CT scan, so it's just a 16, 17 centimetre length scan through the, the patient's head and neck. So you can see how it's moving. So yes, we've done a, a rigid registration. We've moved the treatment couch to match them up precisely every day, but there is some soft tissue movements, even though they're pinned in a, a tight mask, we still get that movement. And that's why it's really important just to make sure that we're as accurate as we can be to reduce that normal tissue toxicity. So photobiomodulation, we're lucky enough in Leicester to have uh, a unit on loan and we have actually purchased our own through uh, a charitable donation from our uh, a current <coughs> or a previous patient. I raised a lot of money uh, with a local rugby club and I wanted to find something that would actually be meaningful to, to him um, and the treatment that he went through. So we, we've purchased uh, this unit. Um, at time of writing, we'd, uh, we'd followed up 77 patients that had gone through treatment, having either treatment to the oral cavity or head and neck region where dose was going to be, let say splashing, it sounds a bit loose, but going through their, their mouth area. Uh, we didn't try it on patients that were kind of just extra oral, so anyone that's having just their larynx treated, we didn't use it uh, on those patients. However, I might do for an, um, just a little lymphedema tri type um, or edema of the, the larynx uh, little trial. So uh, we covered eight um, tumor sites and 57 completed uh, their treatment with either grade two or below mucositis. Which is, in oh, sorry, sorry, may jump. <laughs> I'll stop messing. Uh, which is incredible, really, to to think that patients can still eat during radiotherapy. Um, a lot of patients have the sore mouth. It's not just the sore mouth. Obviously, the dry mouth, the loss of taste. Those things will all impact. Um, but to have a device that might reduce the severity of the, the mucositis is a big win for us. It means that I prescribe less medication, less supportive medication, which then has less knock-on side effects. Um, it means that the patients have a more comfortable mouth and they can eat for longer. If they're eating for longer, it helps with their... Uh, swallowing function, it helps with their bowel function. Half of my role as a head and neck radiographer is sorting out bowels. Um, and if people can eat normal food for as long as possible, then that makes a big difference. Um, so the results that we had, you can see that, uh, say, majority got through with a grade two or less mucositis. 18 of those had chemotherapy as well, which again, to still be eating at week six of radiotherapy with chemotherapy is amazing. 27 finished with paracetamol alone, um, which is a big difference for us. We've generally got a lot of patients on codeine, uh, morphine, and sometimes long-acting morphine, which we did have. We would still not deny it for people that were in pain. Uh, they would be prescribed whatever they needed, um, but we just found that we used less of it, which, again, is a, a big win, a big cost-saving, but also a big side-effect-saving for the patients. Um, we notice with the, the way that we treat now, where the IMRT moves around the body, we have a higher lip dose. So even those that are not having their oral cavity included in their treatment volume, it did actually mean that they're still getting a very high lip dose, which is going to impact on the amount of food that people want to put in their, their mouth. But even patients that, um, despite all advice and nagging, carried on smoking throughout the treatment, were still able to eat during and throughout radiotherapy. Um, which is a, a big win for, for them. It means that they just recover quicker. So some of the other things that we, um, we use, we've got topical lotions, potions um, that we use. But I can't bang on enough about hydration and nutrition. It really does make a, a big difference for our patients. 
Um, and there's some tips that we can give to patients. Um, and the advice probably varies. Um, sometimes we go bland is best in the diet sense. You want it to look amazing, but when it looks amazing, it smells amazing, then you taste it and it's utterly disappointing because it tastes like cardboard. Um, sometimes just sticking with the food that's bland is actually more palatable because at least you can just kind of get it in quickly without it making you gag. Uh, dry mouth, sore mouth, using sprays and gels and chewing gums and sweets. Um, different mouthwashes we've seen on the stands outside. There are a variety around um, reducing the alcohol, caffeine. And again, we found that PBM makes a, a big difference to our patients, about a two-week difference in delay of side effects. But also when they get those side effects, when they get the mouth ulcers, they seem to recover quicker. Um, and that is a, a big win. Um, a lot of patients will, will talk about the tiredness and again it's prioritising goal setting, um, taking the rest when they need it and doing the things that they absolutely have to do, um, but also the things that they enjoy. So rather than just doing the vacuuming or the ironing, actually have a five minute walk just to see if that actually makes you feel a bit better than I'm sure the ironing will. And no smoking. So how do we optimise everything, nutrition, hydration, medication, at the centre of this has to be our patient, we have to make this personalised care. Um, each patient is individual, what they go through is individual, uh, and we must then deliver an individualised package for that. But I can't do that on my own, I need my colleagues, little whoop. Our CNS colleagues, we need our tracking nurses, we need our dietitians, we need our speech and language therapists, we need all of these other health professionals that are there to support the, the patients, uh, not just during treatment but after treatment, and I know Emma will go on to talk about that. Um, so that just brings me to my last slide, um, which is motivation. So uh, we talk a lot about being cheerleaders for our patients. So this is the outcome of uh, agreeing to um, a bet with the patient. So the lady that's uh, on the central picture on the left is, um, in fact, a GP. She had a stage four nasopharynx cancer uh, at the age of 32. She had a one-year-old who was still on maternity leave and was a late diagnosis because of winter bed pressures. You're not in the demographic. You're a young white female. You don't really fit with the nasopharynx. Um, and so she had a delayed diagnosis. Went through treatment, she listened exactly to all of the advice and recovered pretty well. She's not without her long-term effects. Um, but as the years went by, she said, we need to do something, we need to celebrate as a team. I said, great, we'll all run as a team. Um, and then as the team kind of uh, dropped away, uh, it left with myself and sonographer Amy, who's the lady on the right, uh, and we recently completed the Leicester Half Marathon. Um, for me, the biggest moment was the at the end uh, on the picture where she's only crying a little bit, but <laughs> um, for me, crossing that finish line with her was the same as the, the day that she finished her radiotherapy. I was so pleased for her that I'd be able to support her through that journey, but that she'd made that journey, and that was the, the take home for me that Actually, yeah, I was pretty exhausted running that race. Um, but I'd prepared for that race. I'd had 10 weeks of training. I'd methodically gone out running every couple of days uh, so that I was able to do that. Um, she didn't get that training at the start of her radiotherapy. And neither will any of you guys uh, that you've already been through or yet to go through radiotherapy. Um, but the powerful moment was crossing the finish line that, say, she'd been able to not just... Um, survive cancer but recover well from cancer and then to go on to complete a half marathon when the furthest she'd ever run price that was a, a 5k race was incredible so I dedicate this talk to Dr Eleanor Asaya thank you very much for listening yeah so I'm Emma Hallam um, and 10 years ago or just over 10 years ago I set up the first therapeutic radiographer led late effects service of its kind in the UK this is a service that will see any patient, regardless of their cancer that they've had, as long as they live within Nottinghamshire, and we help to deal with any physical and any psychological effect. And I do this along with a whole team of experts, such as dietitians, speech and language therapists, lymphedema specialists, physiotherapists, you name it. So, 
We know that life after cancer can be different for every patient. It has been said that cancer in its treatment can leave a gruelling physical and mental legacy for many years after treatment. We also know that by 2030, there'll be over 4 million people living with cancer in the UK. So that means that you've gone through treatment, you're cured of your cancer, but you are living with the after effects, really. We also know that one in four cancer treatments will have uh, one or more treatment-related consequences. So with that amount of patients living that long after treatment, which is fantastic, but look at the drain that these are going to be having on many NHS services. Some work done by Macmillan back in 2013 when I first started found that 71% of those patients who finished treatment 10 years ago or more had experienced a physical health problem in the last year that was directly related to their cancer treatment. And when you think that follow-up for most head and neck cancer patients finishes at five years, who is helping these patients? They're bouncing around other services and often their needs are not being met. In terms of head and neck, a study that was done back in 2019, 44% had a dry mouth, 28% had skin changes, 22% skin fibrosis, and 14% had dental decay. So for me, and you'll hear me, if you ever hear me speak, I bang on about this all the time, it is no longer acceptable for us to just purely focus on acute toxicity and survival rates, because it's about thinking about we're curing patients, but at what cost? So what is a late effect? Well, a late effect is a, is a health problem, or an acute side effect that Nick's just talked about that either doesn't settle after treatment is completed or can develop many months, years, even decades after treatment has ended. Often misdiagnosed and under-recognised by many health professionals, they are progressive, they can have a severe detrimental effect on a patient's quality of life, and we know that patients who have many modality treatments, so those who have surgery, radiotherapy and chemo, not only carry an increased risk of acute toxicity, so those side effects on treatment, but also an increased risk of late effects. And for radiotherapy, this is all due to this, the treatment that keeps on giving, and this is the gift called radiation-induced fibrosis. This is a progressive fibrotic sclerotic disorder with varying clinical symptoms that we cannot stop the development of. It stiffens connective tissue, compresses peripheral nerve tracts, contributing to diminished strength, flexibility, and loss of function in the treatment area. It damage, its damage results in shortening of tissues, tendons, like ligaments, muscle atrophy, contraction, brittle bones, lymphedema, and nerve and vascular damage. We also know that subsequent fibrosis, of, as this continues, can lead to more tissue compliance and reduce the function within that area. And you can imagine in the head and neck, that is really significant. We also know that they're difficult to diagnose and management can be complex, but we also know that more damage can be done with, to irradiated tissues with unnecessary, inappropriate investigations. <coughs> so the impact of late effects. Many patients will get a bit of a dry mouth, uh, or whatever their late effects, it might not bother them much. But for others, these symptoms will often be more than one, so it's a cluster effect, and together they will combine to have a real negative effect on their quality of life, and sometimes can really start to affect the functioning of that area, like I've said. And for some patients, this can actually be um, um, life-threatening. If you think about aspiration and patients then getting aspiration pneumonia, it can be really, really significant. So what do we commonly see? Well, we've talked a lot about dry mouth, and yes, it's about not being able to eat and communicate, but for me, it's also about how it affects patients and their relationships. So many patients are not able to kiss afterwards, and that obviously is a big, can be a big part of, um, of, of, a, of a relationship. It's the excessive thick secretion. So we've talked yesterday about improving saliva, but we see patients who have a really dry mouth for up to eight years and then develop these really thick secretions where they're just pulling them out of their mouth so they can't speak, they can't eat, and it affects their swallow. The changes to the swallow itself, either by the actual damage that's been done by the actual tumour or the radiotherapy due to this fibrosis. And of course, within that, we, we include the, the taste changes and the changes to your smell as well. This obviously leads to changes in voice and weight loss due to not being able to get that nutrition on board, but tooth decay is probably one of the most heartbreaking uh, late effects that I see of our patients. 
This is where patients' teeth are going completely black and decaying and crumbling away, and they cannot get access to a dentist. I spend a lot of try, time ringing round, well, not myself, my, my support worker does, ringing round dental practices trying to say, can you take an NHS patient on? Because the problem we have is that our patients often cannot afford to pay for private um, dentistry. The fibrosis and skin changes, so you'll often see that, that within, the, um, within, within the head and neck area, that, that, that the skin becomes quite thick and fibrotic. We call it a woody neck. So patients often will have complete neck movement for up to five years, and then over the next coming years, they can't move their necks anymore. So they come into me and they're like this. Trismus, this is where you get restricted mouth opening due to the TMJ here, where it fibrosis up, and over time, patients just stop opening their mouths. If they're not following exercises, and I can see somebody there with a, <laughs> with a therabyte, you know, eventually it becomes where they can open their mouths, then they can't get their dental hygiene done, they can't um, clean their mouths, and they can't eat and drink and communicate. Um, stiffness in this whole area, like I've already said, and we mustn't forget about things like hearing loss, tinnitus and balance issues. Again, this might be due to the actual damage that's been done by the tumour or the treatment from the fibrosis, but also the lymphedema causes hearing loss as well. Lymphedema is really significant, and we need to be identifying this at a much earlier time point. Um, we also see patients with tingling in their hands because of the peripheral neuropathy, and we also see pains and spasms within that area, and of course, thyroid issues. The less common ones that we see, although I've seen every single one of these in our service, is this um, burning tongue syndrome. It's where your mouth feels like and your tongue that it's constantly on fire. And this is often linked to recurrent oral thrush. Many patients will be going to their GP, being given nystatin, which never works hardly for a, for a, um, a late effect of oral thrush. But GPs will not swab these patients to see if they're actually, and a lot of them have built up a resistant to these antifungals. Chronic radiation dermatitis, where the skin is actually breaking down and sometimes causing necrotic ulcers. And again, their skin has healed really well after, after actual treatment, but this is many, what can happen many years down the line. We also see quite significant nerve damage, where patients obviously, and this comes along with a lot of pain, and osteoradial necrosis of the jaw. And I've seen one, of it, uh, one patient who had it of the cervical spine, so just here. This is something that actually only up to 5 to 7% of patients will experience. And it's something that we're quite good at identifying. And lots of surgeons will, will talk to patients about osteoradial necrosis, but they very rarely talk about all the rest. Carotid artery patency, when the fibrosis has started to fibrose up the carotid artery, so we need to be aware of this and the risk of patients having a stroke. And I do see a lot of patients who come in with these what with neck spasms due to the problems with the cervical dystonia. And patients will talk about... Um, people saying they look like I'm having a fit because these, these spasms are so significant and so painful when they have them. Dropped head syndrome, there's a couple of pictures there of patients who literally, because of the damage to the muscles, they cannot hold their own head up anymore. So they're tripping up all the time. Um, and of course, we do see secondary cancers within the area, and it's usually a skin cancer. But what we need to be thinking about is the common late effects. So they're very much the physical effects. And of course, Pain is a physical effect, um, but one in three will have chronic pain, and it will persist for many years and affect in this daily function, and many patients are not getting access to specialist pain services which they need. They're often left on these pain medications that don't actually work. We also know that if you have un untreated pain, it can lead to unnecessary hospital admissions. In terms of fatigue, it's actually the most commonly reported symptom up to 10 years out of treatment. And up to 35% will have this severe um, cr um, chronic fatigue. And this really can have a negative impact on social um, and occupational um, and general functioning. But for me, it's more the psychological effects that these patients experience. It's the patients who just say, and many will say to me, if I'd have known what I knew now, I'm not sure I would have gone through that treatment. And that's how I've done the same as you. It's heartbreaking when I know I delivered, some, sometimes I delivered that treatment. It's also how patients will say, well, they told me I should expect to get a dry mouth. They told me I might get some discomfort in that area. So I don't think I should complain to my consultant about it. And they stop talking to their family and friends about it because for many, they're living like this for years and nothing is changing. So they stop talking about it and can become quite isolated within themselves. 
We see lots of relationship changes where patients are not sleeping in the same beds anymore because dry mouth, the thick secretions, the coughing all night, they might need to sleep up because of lymphedema. And we know that when patients have had a physical intimacy before with their partner and then they start to lose that, that can have a real big impact on how they feel within social society. So it's not just about the body image concerns, it's actually sexual difficulties that we need to be addressing as well. And of course, I've already mentioned about the educational challenges, and many patients don't get back to work that they were doing before. And of course, reduced cognitive conditions have been mentioned already. As I said, patients never attend with just one symptom. They usually have about 10, to be absolutely honest. So we have to be addressing each of these individual needs to be making that real impact and helping a patient with their quality of life. And that's why you'll find many late effects services really focus on this holistic approach to treatment, which is looking at the physical along with the psychological, emotional, financial and the spiritual. So this is not really to flag about my service, but just to really show you here that, that these are the patients that we've seen over time. This is for all cancer patient referrals to the late effects service. But just look at that. Over half have been head and neck patients. So it just shows you the impact of the treatment that we, that, that we give for cancer treatment. The longest time from treatment for a head and neck patient was 33 years out of treatment when they got referred to our service. And they were really struggling with this, you know, thick woody neck due to the fibrosis, lymphedema, neck spasms and swallowing issues. In Nottingham now, we have developed um, some PROMS, that's patient reported outcome measures. So it's, it's a screening tool, basically, that we get all of our patients to do for up to 10 years out of treatment, trying to identify these needs and then get them into the right services. And this just shows you some of the data from that. So how do we manage late effects? Well, the first thing is education. Now, this is about education of professionals, and I do a lot of talking up and down the country trying to educate professionals about late effects. I have surgeons who say to me, well, there's nothing we can do about it, so I don't think we should do anything about that. Or I'm curing your cancer, so you should be grateful. It's amazing the amount of... Uh, there's nothing we can do about a dry mouth, so I don't even bother telling patients about it. Phenomenal. But for me, it's about educating patients. We need to be telling patients more about these late effects. And it's really difficult as to when we should start to do this. Yes, we do it at consent, but a lot of patients don't remember that. Because, of course, at that point, you just want your treatment and want to be cured. But for many patients, it's about drip feeding it throughout the treatment and then making sure that they have got access to late effects services. It's about identifying early. I've said that, yes, radiation-induced fibrosis is progressive, but if we can get those speech and language therapy exercises in, if we can identify the lymphedema early, we know it can be resistant to therapies if we lead that. So we need to be identifying these needs and tracking them over time. And we also need to be encouraging self-management. We cannot, we haven't, the NHS has not got the capacity to keep these patients constantly that are struggling with late effects. So what can we do to empower patients to self-manage their late effects? And that's what I'm going to talk about now. So really, first of all, it's, it's making sure that patients understand what a late effect is. We cannot expect a GP to know 12 years out of treatment that that side effect is related. They'll bounce them around everywhere else. We need to make sure that patients are noticing reporting change. And yes, we're very good at reporting new lumps, new swellings, but we don't start to report when our mouths start to close and we're not, not getting that. As soon as we start to notice swallowing issues, we need to be reporting it back to our our centres, speech and language teams, or late effects services if you've got one. Follow given exercise plans. I can't stress this enough, and in Nottingham we've designed a, um, an exercise programme that patients are now encouraged to follow for life. And the patients that are doing it are the patients that are not so far after six years of tracking them are the ones that are not developing the fibrosis to the severity um, of some of the others. Good oral hygiene, and we've talked about that this morning, so I'm not going to that. And of course, fun, you know, dental care is so important. And you need to be managing dry mouth, and I'm going to come on to that again. Again, good nutrition and hydration, following any skincare advice, but also engaging some physical activity. We know that this not only makes you feel better, but it reduces the risk of recurrence, and that's been proven in many cancers now. But there was a paper out a couple of weeks ago that actually said that it if you have patients that are engaging physical activity of 150 minutes a week, it actually reduces the amount of consequences of treatment that you'll get. Um, and ask about new treatments because you never know what's out there. Now, living with a dry mouth, I don't recommend products because a lot of my patients cannot get hold of them, GPs will not prescribe them, and patients cannot afford to keep, you know, 
buying on themselves for life. So we try to come up with top tips that patients can use. Many of these have come from patients themselves that they've been using. So the first one is obviously sugarless um, um, sweets and gum. Anything containing, that containing xylitol can be very good. Um, parsley frozen fruit juices, melon and pineapple chunks, but again, this is only if your swallow is safe. So sometimes you might want to check that out with your swallowing therapist. Um, as for a mouthwash, the best one you can use is half a teaspoon of salt and half a teaspoon of bicarbonate of soda. And many of you will have probably been recommended that when you're actually on your treatment as well. Um, but most of my patients, um, I will give them a plastic spray bottle and say, fill that with some olive oil and some water, and that is actually all you need, along with keeping your lips nice and moisturised as well. Um, coconut oil can be particularly good, or olive oil, just half a teaspoon at night, and moving that around will help to put that a bit of a lipid barrier over the night. Foods to avoid, chocolate, pastry, caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, all of these do have a drying effect on your mouth, um, and some patients have found benefit from using a, a mist tube humidifier at night. In terms of swallowing, we do a lot. Of, we do actually do a rehab service now with our swallowing team, um, and I sit on there from the late effects point of view, because we know that if we can get patients swallowing and off their feeding tubes as soon as possible, they're less likely to lose that function. They're keeping that swallowing going and trying to prevent the severity of that fibrotic buildup. Many patients will be given exercise, but you can find them actually on the internet. Um, not so much swallowing exercise, I might add, but this facial yoga, really trying to keep that whole area of the head and neck moving. And even chewing gum can be really effective. So can making sure that your posture is very good can help with um, any lymphedema, and some patients will need to sleep upright. In terms of lymphedema, we know that up to 90% of patients will actually experience, and it's not just the external lymphedema, it's the internal lymphedema, and that's often what patients first start to notice their swallowing going off. And again, you can find, if you haven't got access to a lymphedema specialist, and many patients won't, um, there is information out there. And there's a couple of sites that I've put there, and again at the end, that you might want to have a look at that will guide you to some self-management for that. There is some treatments out there for fibrosis, and for many years now I've been very much identifying the lymphedema early, managing that with rollers, this kinesio tape, trying to drain the area with simple lymphatic drainage, and also trying to encourage what we call myofascial release, where we try and break down that fibrosis. But about 16 months ago, we were very lucky to get the photobiomodulation PBM uh, machine in for patients who were using it for on treatment. And I know they've been using this in some fibrotic um, studies and also for some lymphedema therapy. And honestly, it has revolutionised our practice. I cannot live without it now. I have patients who are trying to remortgage their houses to buy one because we are not only reducing pain, we've got a couple of patients back to work who couldn't go to work because they couldn't drive because they couldn't move their nets, have now got full net movement. We've got three patients off their feeding tube two to three years out of treatment and the dietitian and swallow team are saying, looking at the fees, I can't believe that this is working, but it absolutely is. But all of it works in conjunction with targeted exercises as well. I'll be very honest about that. The most improvement we have is trismus, so patients who cannot open their mouths. A couple of patients at the start of it were literally through a straw and now eating egg sandwiches. Phenomenal. So no exercise, in my opinion, or therapy has, has ever had that, that difference. So where can you find access and support and information? Well, I'm proud to say there's around about 27 late effects services that have been set up throughout the UK now. Not all of them focus on head and neck, but they all usually start in pelvis, but we are building. And I know we've got a few people here today who are really keen on setting up late effects services. So I would always try your place where you had your radiotherapy treatment if you want to try and see if they've got one. Maggie's centres are quite good at signposting as well. And of course, your GP, if you feel you've got stiffening or you've got some swelling, sit, your GP can make these referrals. You don't need to go back to your specialist team. Obviously, the swallows are fantastic, and we use the support boxes a lot, so patients can actually try a product before they go and buy it. Um, and there's some other charities there. But I want to just mention the Cancer Rehab PT. She's actually a therapist. I can't remember if it's Australia or New Zealand she's based, but she does some fantastic um, YouTube clips and on Instagram, on how you can reduce the fibrosis and keeping your whole lymphatic system moving. And the Lymphedema Support Network and the British Lymphedema, Lymphedema Society have got a patient area on there, so you know you're following safe um, practice there. Jo Devine is actually a nurse who set up a, um, um, 
a, 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 sorry, a, a website and a bit of a charity, I don't think it's charity, but, um, and she does good sexual health education for patients along with products. Um, so there's some fantastic stuff on there if, if you feel that you might need to have some support there. Um, Trekstock is a charity that helps patients who are treated in their 20s and 30s and like that 40s because we know that they have additional needs. These are the patients that were trying to get back to work after treatment, so they can be offer some really good support there. And then Move Against Cancer is a charity that c provides lots of information on exercise. So they very much link in with the 5K Park runs, but it's called 5K Your Way. But they've got exercises on their website. You can do seated chair-based exercises. So a really good support if that's what you want to look for. And just this last point, really. You know, we need to think about it. Every patient goes through this treatment differently and every patient's experience of a dry mouth will be different. Every patient's experience of a, of a painful neck spasm, spasm will be different. But sometimes it depends on who we ask. And as professionals, we should not be the ones who determine whether a patient should get access to support or help. And in my experience, it's only those patients who've got the real high needs are getting the support that we need. And what I want to be doing, and certainly what late effect services want to do, is get that support in earlier at that much more before the needs become so significant. And that's me. Thank you. But is there time for some questions? Uh, field? A, a few, yeah. And then I'm sure <laughs> over lunch and everything. So, yeah. Just any questions <laughs> from all of that wonderful information? Bamboos. Yes, just one here. Pants in the middle. Um, I've heard a lot said about the PBT. Um, I'm um, dealing with. Um, multiple issues that Emma was talking about, uh, 14 years out of cancer, but I actually had 130 grays of radiation or to the head and neck um, for an HPV um, positive tumor. Um, and I'm using a lot of the things. I would like to know it, what the, um, how easily I could access trying um, PBT. Um, it's not currently available in the Surrey area, but I just wondered if there's a way around this. Okay, I'll, I'll let there Emma are, Yeah, <laughs> so there are, and I'll definitely go back to your original department because they are all talking to the, to the PBM companies. And I would also have a little chat with Thor that are here outside um, because they know the centres that have got these services. Also private lymphedema practices that have got, and they will see you five, for fibrosis. They don't just deal with lymphedema. So I'd certainly have a little chat with Thor um, that's there as well. But like I say, there are many late effects services. Many radiographers now are trying to set these services up and many trying to get these machines in. So yeah, that's what I'd do. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, uh, one down there, please. Thanks. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Ian. I'm, uh, I'm head, and, uh, head and neck specialist in um, Bath RUH. I was just wondering, sorry, the first lady who spoke, um, uh, forgive me, I forgot your name. Um, I was just wondering about, um, I, I've previously worked in centres where we've had um, a sort of prehabilitation clinics um, and really want to try and push to set one up in, in my current centre. Um, how, how was that set up in yours and, and, and what was the challenges you faced in, in getting it set up? Yes. yes, please. Um, you and me both. I'd, uh, I'd also like a service to be set up. So uh, at the minute, the prehabilitation that we've got is with um, just our dietitians. We'll obviously go through um, nutrition and the impact of having a feeding tube. Um, and we've got our CNSs who will go through kind of psychological care in, in kind of a, a basic sense. But they, obviously there isn't the full psychological assessment. Uh, we use the holistic needs assessment from Macmillan, um, but that's kind of the baseline that we go to. We don't have uh, a physical assessment element to it. So, yeah, you and me both, I'd really like to, to set that up. So there are obviously centres that have that set up already. Um, I think it's a model that we could all kind of follow rather than recreating things. Um, but I think it makes a, a big difference. That was my master's project project. Um, 
Um, I think it, it could hopefully take some business off Emma. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's never we're, we're always going to have this gap of patience even if we started prehabbing everybody now we've still got 15 20 years of patients that are still going to have those late effects that go through but if we could minimize what people are experiencing during radiotherapy um, then maybe they will recover better um, we can see it across the surgical setting, but that's, that would be the, the hope, really, to, to minimise those, those late effects for, for patients. I, I do actually work in a research centre where we're, um, we run a prehab and then rehab service, so I'm happy to chat with you afterwards. But I think what Nick's saying as well is with the prehabilitation movement that's sort of gaining momentum all the time, I think it's it's harder to set up an actual service for prehabilitation and then formal restorative rehabilitation afterwards but the principles of prehabilitation and those three main domains of good nutrition boosting physical health and this psychological preparedness and then also targeted prehab I think for head and neck um, in just you know what we are actually going to ask patients to do in terms of wearing the mask um, you, you know there's lots of targeted prehab stuff we can do as well isn't there as well as boosting physical and psychological health to help just generally prepare for the the demands of radiotherapy um but yeah it's it's there's lots of mounting evidence for it particularly in surgery um but we, we have less in radiotherapy for evidence for prehab but i think it'll be coming thank you yeah. yes um shall we as it yeah we'll move on to the next session now Yes, that's absolutely fine. Yes, thank you. Thanks, everyone. But we've hand sorted it, so. so he's oh, he's coming. Oh, he's definitely coming. But but I'll let you take over. Paul's Paul's offered to chair this session. Um, you know, it's got to be quick, sorted. Sharon's out there. You're going to get a taster of. I'm what she's gonna, like if you run late. I, I'm going to be very quick to introduce everybody. So yeah, hi everyone. My name's Paul, uh, and I'm yep chairing this session. And I'm introducing the the people who are hosting us. So I'm introducing Fahida. I'm introducing Sam. Naomi is here, and we're going to have Arthur, who's going to be joining us from uh, the USA. So, I don't know what order you guys are speaking in, though. That's, so, it's you first, Naomi. In which case, Naomi, everybody. Thank you. That's right. Hi, Victoria. Nice to meet you. Uh, will this go on to the talk hopefully. So um, myself and Victoria, Victoria is one of our registrars and I work in Torbay, I'm uh, one of the oncology consultants there and we're going to talk about the Torbay 14 day pathway and hopefully it's going to go on to the, <laughs> to the slides. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk a bit about the background to the pathway, why we did it and why we set it up, um, talk a bit about the kind of behind the scenes of radiotherapy planning. So um, try and highlight some of the people involved who even the patients here who have been through the treatment um, don't necessarily get to meet. Um, and then we're going to talk about the 14 day pathway five years on. So actually it's been running for six years now, but we did an audit after five years um, and Victoria is going to talk about that. Um, so there's obviously lots of different subsites of head and neck cancer based on where the cancer starts. Um, and there's also different pathologies of head and neck cancer. So the vast majority are something called squamous cell cancer, um, but there's other different types of cancers as well. So from the radiotherapy point of view, we split these into category one and category two cancers. So obviously this is nothing to do with how important the cancer is. It's simply related to the way the cancer cells react to the radiotherapy. So squamous cell cancers and small cell cancers tend to grow quite quickly. And actually, if you have a gap within a radiotherapy treatment, it makes it less effective. Whereas for category two cancers, you can have a delay for up to five days and there's no evidence that that affects the outcome. 
And there's also evidence that if people have surgery prior to their radiotherapy, that if the radiotherapy is delayed beyond a certain time, that that again can affect outcome and survival. Um, and then there's increasing evidence that the time from the decision to treat, and I'll go into that a bit more later, to the radiotherapy makes the difference in outcome. Um, and I'm not going to go through this evidence today. There is a lot, and I'm happy to kind of go through it and email people if you want me to another time. So in light of this, the UK guidelines back in 2017, it was that people should be treated within four weeks of the decision to treat. Um, but actually now it's saying that people should be treated ideally within 17 days of the decision to treat because of the effect on the outcome. So um, I started as a consultant in Torbay back in 2017, and before that I was actually in a big cancer centre in South Wales where I was one of four consultants. So um, when I came down here, obviously being the sole consultant, you have a closer idea of kind of when you see patients and when they start treatment, and I noticed that there were some delays. So what we did is kind of do a timeline analysis and look at all the different steps that take place in radiotherapy planning. Um, so before uh, myself as an oncologist get to meet the patients, we discuss everything in a multidisciplinary meeting and go through the scans and the biopsies and things like that and, and work out as, as a group what we think the best treatment is for someone and then obviously meet them in clinic uh, and go through the diagnosis uh, with yourselves if I've treated you um, and talk about what we think the best treatment is. And so this is the point that the decision to treat is made after this discussing discussion with yourselves. And then, um, again, for those of you who have been through this, lots of this you're well aware of, you have to have a radiotherapy planning scan and the dreaded mask is made. Um, and there's also a lot of appointments that are kind of squeezed into this time from when we see you to when you start treatment. And again, you're kind of aware for yourself, it's a very, very busy time. Um, you need to have dental assessments and meet the surgeons or, or dental technicians, um, feeding tube placements, and then meet our team in terms of the kind of prehab we do with the specialist nurses and the dietitians and speech and language therapists. And then by, behind the scenes, what we do in oncology, this is what my kids call my drawing and colouring session, uh, but we outline where the cancer is essentially. So based on the planning CT scan, uh, ourselves or the radiographers fuse the other imaging that you've had, um, so on the top you can see that there's a PET scan which is fused with a CT planning scan and on the bottom an MRI scan. Um, and we use this to work out exactly where the cancer is and exactly where the areas at risk are. And also at this time we outline lots and lots of normal structures as well. So uh, in the discussions earlier on we're talking about um, late effects and, and acute effects and we're well aware of this. So we try and uh, implement all this information and use this to minimise toxicity. Uh, so this, this is the outlining, so in red you've got where the disease is in the base of tongue. Um, sorry, some of you probably aren't used to look at the scans, so I should say um, this is a slice of a CT scan. So we look at scans, this is called an axial image where we look at them like this, and then the image on the right is a coronal image where you look at a slice through a scan like this, okay? Um, and at the top of the image on the left you can see the jawbone, the mandible here, and there's the vertebra at the black and white which has the spinal cord running through it. Um, and then the area in orange is the area we want treated to at kind of a really high dose, uh, the blue slightly lower dose, and the areas in green are the prophylactic areas, so the areas where there's risk of being cells, cancer cells that we want to get rid of if they are there, um, so that's treated to a slightly lower dose. And then we give all this information to the planners and uh, physicists and dosimetrists who you guys never get to meet. Um, and they input all the information and the kind of priorities for what we want treated and come up with a treatment plan. And then we evaluate this plan. Um, so you can see on the image on the left, it kind of shows all the outlines of where we want treated. And on the right is the radiotherapy plan. Um, and this is, I just wanted to highlight, often patients say to me, you know, why do some people get more of a dry mouth and some people less of a dry mouth? And a lot of it is to do with where the disease is and where we need to treat. So you can see on this person, the disease is in the tonsil. And there's disease in the lymph nodes really close to one of the saliva glands. So the saliva glands, um, or the big parotid glands, so one of the saliva glands are highlighted in green either side here. And they account for about 70% of the saliva production. And so because the disease there is close to uh, the saliva gland, we're unable to spare that gland with the radiotherapy. Um, but you can see that we, we get the machine to work as hard as it can to spare the other saliva glands, so hopefully that one will recover long term. 
But if people have lymph nodes involved both sides of the neck, obviously that's a lot harder because we want to cure the cancer and we've got to prioritise treating that. So again, the scan on the right, the areas in red are the high dose, the areas in green are that prophylactic dose, and the areas in blue are the lower dose. And then to check that we can do what the computer simulation says we can do uh, to treat the patient um, that's tested with a single fraction uh, on what's called a phantom. So this is put on the linear accelerator and it runs through one fraction of the treatment and measures the dose at different areas to check we can deliver this. And then the treatment is, is good to go. So um, back in 2017, we looked at the pathways of two patients who, who took the kind of full four weeks to go through and then looked at delays in the system and worked out whether we could kind of speed the process up. So it involves lots of meetings and discussions with all the different people kind of mentioned on the slides um, to see how we could do this, going through the evidence and why we want to do this, um, and then kind of working together um, as a team. So this is our 14-day pathway in Torbay. So the patients are discussed on a Monday in the uh, multidisciplinary meeting. We meet them on the Tuesday. The planning scan is often on the Tuesday or the Wednesday. Um, and then we do all our outlining and we review the volume. So um, all centres now have to peer review all their volumes. So it's not based on what a single oncologist says needs to be treated. It, it's done as a whole region. And then the physicists and the radiographers do their parts. Um, and then hopefully the, the aim is that the patient starts two weeks after the MDT discussion. Right, I'll hand over to Victoria. Thank you. Um, so I'm one of the oncology registrars and I joined Torbay last year. Um, so we did an audit of the last five years using the 14-day pathway. Um, and um, we looked at all patients treated from January 2017 through to December 2022, so um, it may have included some of you in the room. Um, and, um, Dr. Cole and Dr. Chambers collected data prospectively as they saw patients. They documented the decision to treat date, the site of the patient's cancer, um, the radiotherapy start date, and the date of surgery if the patient had surgery in addition to radiotherapy. Um, we then automatically calculated the date from the decision to treat to radiotherapy start or in the patients that had surgery, um, the time from surgery to post-operative radiotherapy. Um, any reasons for delay were documented as we went along and then in addition I went back and looked at all the cases to check that we had clearly documented these. Um, so we included all patients who were receiving radiotherapy with curative intent for squamous cell carcinomas, so those are the category 1 patients, um, and we included patients who had radiotherapy as their primary treatment and also those who had it post-operatively. Um, we excluded anyone who was having non-curative treatment, um, non-squamous cell cancers or benign cancers, and anyone who had neoadjuvant chemotherapy or targeted treatment, as we would usually give those before radiotherapy, so the treatment would be more prolonged. Um, so our aim was to treat all patients who were having radical head and neck radiotherapy within 14 days of their decision to treat. And for those patients having post-operative radiotherapy, um, we aimed to start their radiotherapy within 35 days of their surgery. Um, so these are our results. So over the five years, we treated 187 patients in total, and we treated 62.6% .6 of them within 14 days. So that's the blue area on the chart there. As Dr. Cole said, the um, national guidance says that we should treat patients within 17 days, and we achieved that for 63.7% of our patients. We broke it down looking over the five years at the um, number of patients that achieved the 14-day pathway. Um, so that's the orange bar for each year. Um, you can see there is some variation over the years. Um, we had a, a difference in the number of patients per year, um, partly due to the pandemic and partly due to um, the fact that initially Dr. Cole was our sole consultant and then we went on to have an additional consultant, Dr. Chambers. Um, you can see in 2022, um, there were slightly fewer patients who met the 14-day pathway, and I'll come to why that might have been in a moment. So um, we then looked at the reasons that patients might not have achieved the 14-day pathway. Um, there was a significant number of patients, 28, who, for whom we couldn't find a cause in the notes. Um, but the most common reasons were um, enrolment in clinical trials, um, and that's something that we've been keen to do for our patients. 
um, post-operative um, issues such as um, wound healing or need for further surgery, which um, I'll talk about a bit more in a moment. And then um, patient choice. Um, often when we were looking back, patients might have delayed for a significant family event such as a wedding. Um, and then um, fewer patients for diagnostic investigations or insertion of a rig or dental procedures. Um, when we looked at the subgroup, so those patients who had surgery and then post-operative radiotherapy, there were 75 patients who fitted that group. 52% of them were treated within our target of 35 days, and 65% were treated within the national target of 42 days. Um, as you would expect, slightly more of these patients were delayed for, um, because of post-operative reasons. Um, as I'm sure many of you will know, the head and neck um, cancer masks that we make to deliver treatment are very tight, so even if there's a small amount of swelling, that might lead to a couple of days delay while we wait for that to go down. So, in conclusion, 63% of our patients were treated within 14 days and 64% within the national target of 17 days. So, we've shown that this is achievable for the majority of our patients. Um, I think the um, audit really showed that we were able to treat patients um, in a timely way by using the, the pathway that we'd created. And we've proved over the last five years that we can deliver this um, for patients in a cost-neutral way over a prolonged period through multiple challenges such as the pandemic. I think it's really important to say that this is only possible because of the involvement of a huge team at Torbay who are um, working across multiple disciplines and really all working together. And as an outsider coming to Torbay, I think the MDT here works really well um, and the team are really enthusiastic about uh, achieving this for patients. That was, effect, um, was reflected in an audit that was done in 2005 nationally and they found that the main reasons that patients weren't um, achieving their radiotherapy in a timely fashion was that diagnostic delays, a lack of MDT involvement or staff shortages, which anyone who works in the NHS will be able to understand. Um, I think the fact that we had some delays because of referral for trials um, possibly reflects the fact that we're a small centre and we're keen to offer our patients any treatment that we think would be beneficial to them and so perhaps delaying by a couple of days so that patients can look into those things and be assessed um, is appropriate and we shouldn't see as a, a downside of this data. Um, and then we will continue to look at future ways that we can improve the pathway. And I just finally wanted to say thank you to everyone within the MDT and especially to our patients because we're very lucky to work with you all. Thank you very much. Victoria, I apologise for not properly introducing you. I'm going to blame the man at the back there in his relentless professionalism. He told me Naomi was uh, speaking, but didn't. I'm here to take the flack for his mess up. Um, so <laughs> I think we're all familiar with uh, probably Sam and Fahida by now, but we're going to listen to Sam and Fahida. You can go first. Cocked up. Because if you'd like to come up and now introduce our special guest from our... Yeah, yeah see, so, you now he's cocked up, so I never cock up. It's down to you, Paul. It's a level of communication. It's a, it's a good job you're short and you're hiding behind there, your embarrassment. <laughs> Is this... I'll leave yeah, that hello, you. everyone. So also, I'd, yeah, Arthur's obviously going to speak at this point now. Now, I have been told Arthur is joining us for live from Boston, and I believe that Arthur has recently got married. And one of the reasons that he's uh, he's not here is he's very much involved in sort of the honeymoon period. <laughs> so he's um he's very busy at home, uh, hence him not being here. So uh, we can go and introduce Arthur. Right, settle down. Come on, we haven't got all day. Our next speaker is the cleverest of all clever dicks. What would you expect from an American? Dr. Laritano is a head and neck cancer surgical oncologist from Boston. He was a full-time academic surgeon at Harvard Medical School, and now his cancer practice sees patients from around the United States. He is a proud international patron of the Swallows and a keen Manchester United fan. So, not that intelligent. 
Best I couldn't make a Waldorf salad. Well, I think we're just out of Waldorf. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Arthur Loretano. It's my uh, pleasure to be here, and, and honestly, my honor. I'm quite sad that I was not able to actually come to the United Kingdom this year, uh, but uh, family plans changed a little bit, and I did have to be home with my new wife, who was a bit under the weather. So yes, I got married in July. Um, but uh, thank you all for taking the time. I'm sitting here at the hospital. I'll, uh, I'll be heading to the theater, as you all say, uh, probably in a couple of hours here. So it is my great pleasure to be here and for you to make the accommodations for me to be here. And I see my two friends on stage, Sam and Fajita, uh, who joined us in the United States and were able to see our multidisciplinary clinic, our multidisciplinary team, and actually came to the operating room with me, which uh, was quite exciting. And we also went to a Red Sox game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will turn it over to them. Oh, great to see you, Arthur. Hey, hello. <laughs> It really is, and it's such a shame that you're not here with us, but I do hope you make next year's conference. So um, do try, hopefully, your wife will be much yeah. better by then, <laughs> which would be great. <laughs> so, Arthur, whilst you're there, I know that um, it was great for us coming out to see you, but um, I don't think we've had the chance to say thank you yet again, because it was such a great opportunity and it was great to meet all of your team and, you know, your wonderful colleagues. It was great going to the theatre, not the operating room, which we kept on calling it. But um, yeah, it was fantastic. So um, I do hope you get to come to Torbay at some point. So I think it's yes. something we should look into in the future. Definitely. Do you want to say a few words? Oh, I agree. Thank you so much. It was probably one of the best things I've ever done coming to visit Boston. So thank you. And I'm really looking forward to all the things that we're going to do together in the future. So lady, yeah, lady, team loved Arthur, I'm going to butt in now as well. Nice to see you, Arthur. I'm one of my best friends. Sure. It's fantastic. Nice I, am, I am going to come on the stage because I think it's great and I wish you was here. But Arthur is a massive, massive big supporter of the Swallows. We have a monthly online meeting every second Wednesday of the month. And I don't think since COVID, Arthur has ever, ever missed one of those meetings. You know, he's a busy guy doing surgery, yet he's always on our meetings, which is fantastic. But I want to know one highlight, Fahida, from you. I'll come to you first because I love putting you on the spot. Out of all that trip, forget the evening sessions because that, that stays between the people on the evening <laughs> sessions. Um, but one highlight from you that you took away from that that you could possibly use here in the UK. So apart from the Red Sox game. <laughs> um, I would say it was and the alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it was um, doing the the joint clinic and meeting the patients. And there was one particular lady that we met every single day the whole time we were there. And I feel that we definitely built a rapport with her. She was she was really just lovely, and she was really struggling to get through her treatment. Um, yeah, for me. And being part of the MDT and then following each patient into the clinic was really good. And there was another chap, I'm so sorry, I forgot his name, but he came back to meet with me and Sam. I know you said one, but there's probably loads. But there was one, um, he came back to talk with us to share his experience of his having his diagnosis and his treatment. And that was really, really special. So thank you for arranging all of that. It was great. I think, Sam, I'm going to ask you the same question. I will be coming to you, Arthur, and when I ask you, keep it clean. So, <laughs> all right. So, Sam. I think um, meeting the team, the patients, but actually seeing that we, being really proud that wherever we are in the world, we're providing good care. Um, and in Arthur's centre, because obviously in America you have to pay for some of your health care, his head and neck cancer patients got their treatment regardless of whether they had to pay for it or not. And I, I, I feel really proud of the NHS. And obviously I feel really proud of Torbay. I think we're just an amazing service. Um, so to be able to share that was just so wonderful. Yeah. So we know that obviously they pay, but what, I mean, I've been to Sloan Kettering and Sloan Kettering has got a, a big sign as you walk through the main door, which has got all the credit cards they accept with a lady behind it. Mm -hmm. And unless you've got one that actually passes with a $20,000 $20, deposit, you don't even get through for a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. um, Arthur's, is Arthur's hospital like that? 
No, not at all. So explain when you walk through Arthur's door what it's like. It's open. It's open and he's there and the team are there, ready to, to help. And they help superbly. I, I don't think I ever saw a credit card machine at Arthur's Hospital at all. No. So Arthur, I'm going to ask you, you had the two ladies with you for almost yep. just over a week. Um, it was interesting. It was fun. Um, without going into the evenings, because you're a great person for entertaining people in the evening, and the Reg Sox game and all the other stuff that we've done, one thing from you that these girls fetch to you that you may look at or have looked at possibly introducing within your treatment pathway? Well, I think, um, I mean, a lot of it's come from the multiple conferences and times I've been over there, things that we've you know, brought over, such as the Thor treatment that was discussed earlier. Um, but I'm just going to say broadly that, you know, Fajita and Sam are so professional and what they do with their MDT in Torbay, they, they fit right in with our team. It was seamless. So they, they really did jump in for a week, meet with our page. Oh. oh, thank you. <laughs> oh. oh, that's not a good look, is it? Is he back? I'm looking at the IT guys and the techie guys and, and praying and... It'll work. So, so go, go on the back of what he's just said, reply without him listening to you. Yeah, it felt like we were just working with a team that we'd worked with. And it sounds a bit cheesy, doesn't it? But that we'd worked with for a really long time. They were really welcoming. Yeah. And they do things differently to how we do as well. One in many thing they ways. do different. Um, I think, so the lady that does the equivalent of my job, I think I would have like to have seen a few more kind of one-to-one -one sessions with the patient or just Sam and I with, the, you know, the equivalent with the patient. Just because I think when you're, well, we all know, I'm sure patients can relate to this, when you've got so many people in a room, you you know, you can feel like you're just being scrutinised a bit. So I think I would have liked to have seen a bit more one-to-one -one or just a smaller size clinic. But one thing I will say is that regardless of where you are in the world, the patients are just the they're the same the world over and they have and want the same needs which is TLC the you know kindness just to be heard you know and it, the same as their carers we met some of their carers as well um but it was really inclusive and that's what I really liked and even when we went around the ward and I think I went with a bit of you know, if I'm being honest, sorry, Arthur, I went with preconceived ideas. I thought it was all going to be like a bit jazz hands and, you know, a bit over the top. But that, you that know. That was the evening. <laughs> but, um, but it wasn't that at all. It was, a, it was a really intimate hospital. It really was. And we walked around and we saw lots of different departments. We went into ICU. Um, yeah, it was, I was really taken aback. I loved it. It went far too quickly and I really learned a lot. So, Arthur, sorry, we lost you halfway. Do you want to continue? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, what, what amazed me the most was, you know, I always get new ideas and, th new ideas and things from uh, working with all of you. I know that um, Fajita and Sam spoke to a couple of our patients, in particular with mucositis, and had some ideas. We have a patient on Keytruda who really had some really bad reactions. But what impressed me, what I was trying to say, was the professionalism of these two. Um, they really became part of the team for the whole week, whether they realized it or not. So they met with patients, they met with carers, they were right in the department, they were in the clinic, they were in the theater with me, and, you know, really sat and met with patients, not just as visitors, but, and I think it speaks to their professionalism and how when multidisciplinary teams are run correctly and run well, in my estimation, you can jump from one team to the other and jump right in very quickly. Um, you know, and I think that was the thing that I got out of there being there was that the MDT idea really has taken off. And I say that because there may be people in the audience who um, don't realize that it wasn't always done this way. And when I first, uh, I was at the Dana-Farber, which is where I was part of the multidisciplinary team. And when I came out to our hospital out in the local area uh, in Boston, we didn't have this. It took me about 10 years to get this established. And so people would take, you talk about delays in treatment it would sometimes take four or five weeks to get someone's treatment begun because they had to have so many different appointments set up individually. We didn't have a navigator. We didn't have all these people doing this. So, you know, the idea of starting treatment within 17 days would have been unheard of back then. Um, so I, I think that the whole MDT 
idea, which you guys do very well in the UK, at least at the centers I've been, obviously, uh, is, is still something that doesn't happen everywhere. Mm. And it's something I still don't take for granted. And, you know, I've been running the one in Lowell since 2006. And like I said, back in 1992 and 93, I had been doing it at the Dana-Farber. Um, for you, you were mentioning about the size of the clinic. I kind of caught the end yeah, of that. Yeah, I was just saying, and it happens here as well, but sometimes when you've got a patient in the clinic and you've got, it's that multidisciplinary team and there's a lot of you in the room. I think yeah. um, one element of practice that I think if I was there, what I would like to do is to just have more one-to-one -one pa patient nurse or, you know, with the kind of cancer support team. Um, because I think that's when you build that extra bit of rapport with patients and we spoke with Kylie about that and then we got the opportunity to do that with a few of your patients and just seeing so you know when patients were on their treatment just allocating a specific time within the week where you see them and just sit you know review them and assess them and it to be quite a structured assessment to see how they're getting on um but actually, as the week went on, that did start to happen, particularly with this lady that I mentioned. And, you know, it was it was great to talk with her and give her some ideas. And, you know, some of the things that we suggested, she tried. We suggested ice chips. And the next day, yeah. she came back and said that it really, really helped. So, you know, it was just, you know, it, it didn't feel like we were visitors. It felt like we were, you know, having the opportunity to be a nurse and a speech and language therapist just in a different environment, which was great. I thought, I, yeah, thought, I thought, Arthur, I thought from an outsider looking in, they just walked in that, that room that first day. And before you know it, both of them were part of your team. And not only right. that, like you say, the team took these two girls in as if they'd just got a new job. And, yep. they, and they just ran with it. And that's got to be every credit to these two. But it's also got to be every credit to our NHS teams. Because wherever they are in the world... And maybe that's one of the problems we've got where we're losing so many staff to abroad because the NHS do all the training and do all the processing and then people bugger off elsewhere. Um, and maybe that's the reason why, because I'm sure if these two girls were looking for a job, maybe they could uh, find place in America, um, sat with you, yeah. Arthur. Um, yeah. and, and I know that those conversations were had. So every credit to these guys that picked NHS in Torquay and Torbay over America and Arthur and the team there and four times wages. So there's got to be something here in Torquay. So maybe you need to come and work for us over here, Arthur. It's, it's always possible. <laughs> um, but I, th I thought from, from my point of view, it was fantastic. Now, um, we've got Paul from Thor on the stage who is obviously doing a little bit for me and he's a great friend as well and I've known him for many years and it was lovely to see the Thor machine working out there as well mm. and I know Emma talks an awful lot about it and has talked about it but to actually see it then in America and when I spoke to that patient in America using it saying that it was the best thing that he had ever been given so what's your thought on the Thor machine that you're seeing from your end Arthur? Well, Paul's here, and Paul might want to give you a question or two on the Thor machine, but good, give me your opinion on the Thor machine. No, I think we've continued to see excellent results with it. Um, you know, I think we've seen a marked reduction in mucositis. As a result, patients are able to maintain PO intake much better, um, and, and I think as, you know, our speech and language therapists have worked very hard with it, so I think we have seen reduced trismus, which has been key. Uh, we've had a lot of patients prior to using Thor where trismus has been a big issue. In addition, we always think about the dryness with radiation treatments and with the various treatments we do. But uh, I will tell you with some of the robotic treatments I do for tonsil cancer, when we follow them up with radiation, or some of the palate cancers that I take care of, some people get significant trismus from the fibrosis of the muscles. And the Thor treatment has been huge. Perfect. Paul, would you want to ask him a question? A great opportunity. Yeah, that, that, that'll do for me, Arthur. Thank you. Um, um, I, I would like to catch up with you in relation to what Emma spoke about here earlier in regards to late effects. So I am going to be in touch with you in regards to that. But, um, no, for now, I'll leave it at that. But you didn't know Thor was going to be mentioned. No, I didn't. Thank you. <laughs> Just to get it out there that, you know, you're not paying me extra today. Absolutely. Right, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. So your thoughts of when you went out there and saw the Thor machine out there, knowing that we were trying to get it going here, what were your thoughts from the patients? We saw patients kind of more from a latest effects 
perspective seeing that because the patients that were on treatment we saw them kind of um just having their treatment or having a review because there were complications so it wasn't necessarily just we were the patients that we saw it was mainly due to complications with pain and that wasn't necessarily because of the mucositis as well but from a late from kind of the late effects post-treatment point of view it, it there were definitely benefits I don't think I was there with them for long enough and we only saw two patients but um Kylie had said that she was really you know she was really pleased with the results that they were collating so which oh, was we got Phil great right so I'm going to finish with you Arthur because obviously laughter is the best medicine, and I can't not ask you... Well, I'm going to ask you two questions. Um, one, forget the hospital visit. Highlight outside the hospital visit with these two lovely ladies that are very much ladies, very much very prim and proper. Give me one great highlight that's going to make this lot laugh their heads off that, we're, that they got up to outside the hospital. And you can say whatever you want because you're in America and nobody can throw anything at you. Well, I am a known lightweight, but they can drink me under the table. <laughs> 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 I have to give them credit. We went to a Red Sox game and it rained. It was yeah. horrible weather, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And you guys stayed for the whole game, but we bailed in about the seventh inning. Mm. There's nine innings in the game. Now, on the flip side, when I was at an FA Cup match in Charlton a couple of years ago, I stayed through the whole thing, and there was no way I would have left. So maybe it was just the novelty, but uh, I give them credit for that. So that was the high point. Perfect. So my last question is, what do you think about Man United this season? Very painful. Uh, painful, it, isn't it? Yeah. And I have to make one correction, um, Chris. There are some people we turn away at my clinic. Um, Liverpool fans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're right there yeah and we've got one on the stage so we, when they were when they were trying to get thor out into your off into your hospital we didn't mention man liverpool at all because i said to paul whatever you do do not talk to him about football and if you do you're a man united supporter so <laughs> lost but they were awful last night did you watch it i did it was painful yeah just yeah. Uh, Okay. Yeah. So. No, nothing else. No, that's it. I have to say, um, you know, I, I can't say enough about what Chris and Sharon and everyone with the swallows do. Um, just worldwide for head and neck treatment, uh, and, and the carers and the patients, and it's it's just such an honor for me to be part of this, and it's great to be at least virtually on stage with all of you, with Sam and Fajita, who are just amazing people. Um, clearly, you guys have a great team there, and, and it's just my honor to be here this morning. Or for me, it's this morning. <laughs> so, uh, Arthur, I know you've got a patient on the bed at the moment waiting for you to go back, and you've just left him asleep. So, we'll let you go. Um, and, you know, thank you for joining us today. Next year, you will be here in the UK, um, even if we have to send Paul's chartered flight out there to pick you Sounds up. Good. Um, or we'll send you the Liverpool plane. That would be even better still. <laughs> oh, no. but we'll oh, see no. you next year and we'll keep on talking thank you very much and well done for everything you do thank you all cheers see you later guys so I'm being told we've got to wind up now it's lunch Paul we want to finish off and say something I've said everything I do I'll, you're the chair in it and you're in charge of the whole session so I don't know if anyone's got points well if, if you'd have read all the notes I'll give you you'll know where we're up to well, I just wanted to know, has anyone got any questions? Yeah. I was just thinking about the 14-day pathway. That's fine. That, it's o listen, it's over to you now. It's nothing to do with me. But you just a couple of questions. That's all right. um, Go sit down. Oh, she has anyone got any There's questions? One lady there. Yes, unfortunately, um, I was kind of astonished with this 14-day um, pathway. My experience, which was m many years ago uh, initially, um, was completely different and one thing that did occur to me was um, in the case of the, the, the type one you know where you have to refer fairly quickly for an SCC um, why in the old days I'm sure this has changed now did people have breaks over the weekend from their radiation so um, 
Um, so we still have breaks over the, over the weekend, so still treating Monday to Friday uh, with breaks over the weekend. Um, what it's talking more about in terms of that is the, the treatment should be over a specific period of time, so, so for a seven-week treatment, 35 days, and it's if it, if it goes beyond that. So if there's a bank holiday um, with our Category 1 patients, you don't add an extra day at the end, you treat twice another day. Um, you know, for instance, this year people are going to be treated on Boxing Day and then doubled up for another day uh, to take account of Christmas Day. So it's it's that that kind of thing that's done for Category One patients, um, but it doesn't make such a difference with Category Two. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just wondered because you said, well, five days is okay for Category Two, um, mm. but why would you why would you actually optionally break for two days every week? Over the weekend, it's because of toxicity as well. Um, so there are schedules that are treating six days a week um, with with one day off. But if you treat, keep treating continually, the toxicity gets too bad. So it's finding the right balance between the toxicity of the treatment and allowing for recovery of the normal tissues and also killing the cancer. So that's kind mm -hmm. of how the, the different fractionation schedules have evolved. Right. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm really happy that it has evolved because, you know, back in the day... Um, I had something like about an eight-week delay, oh, really? um, and um, before actually getting started with the radiation, um, yeah. which I think probably accounted for subsequent Mets mm. yeah. many years along the line. So um, yeah, that's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> over there. There's someone over there. Sorry. <laughs> oh, it's, um, <clears throat> I know I'm short and I can't use the microphone properly, but um, yeah. Um, so thanks for your presentation. I just wondered why you excluded salivary gland cancers from your study and your analysis. Well, it's because most salivary gland cancers are category two cancers, so kind of primary salivary gland. So um, we would, uh, in terms of what we do, we would treat so the, the metastasis from, uh, say, skin to salivary gland that are squamous cell cancers or any primary squamous cell cancers of a salivary gland, we treat as category one cancers, so they're still on the 14-day pathway. Um, but if there's an adenocarcinoma or adenoid cystic or something like that, they're slower-growing tumours. So to be honest, we, we treat within three weeks um, generally, generally slower growing. Yeah, there's 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 less evidence that it will affect the outcome. So um, we didn't evaluate them in the in the kind of project in terms of the five uh, five year data. But um, often people will start within two to three weeks anyway, depending on on what's going on anyway. So interesting we, to see um, that analysis as a separate project, maybe for salivary gland cancers. Yeah, yeah, we, we've got same. a lot of data kind of back at the hospital, so there's there's lots of different things we we can do with that. Yeah, thank you. So one more. He's Ali's got one. I'm invisible. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> Pathologists are invisible to most people, unfortunately. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I just wanted to say thanks a lot and well done for implementing a 14-day pathway that's brilliant and I wish it was a standard of care. We discussed the MDTs and it's still not the norm everywhere, unfortunately. Despite the MDTs, we don't have the same standard of care everywhere. We don't have the same decisions or consistency everywhere. So how do we overcome that challenge of why the patient sort of falling through the holes in the system or being delayed or things not being consistent or some similar sort of pathways being rolled out across the country? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, it's something we've tried to highlight. So we've published it in the kind of uh, clinical oncology, which goes to every oncologist who's registered with, uh, with the RCR in the UK. Um, so the results of the audit have gone out to them. Um, and again, pre previously, when we did the audit in 2017, um, kind of discuss that with people at a national meeting. So we're trying to get it out there in terms of it's, it's nothing, uh, it doesn't require lots of technology, it doesn't require lots of money, it's just a case of working together cohesively as an MDT, all towards, you know, working for the patients and improving outcomes. Um, so, you know, I think part of uh, this in terms of going forward um, as kind of patients, you've, you have got a strong voice and kind of going back to centres and seeing if they can, can improve things um, and improve pathways, then, you know, I think that would be very good. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm not on. I've been told it's wrap-up time, so it's lunch time. So, uh, yeah, thanks. Big round of applause for everybody here from Torbay. Everyone enjoy their lunch.